I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! Hey, what time is it? It is hopeless time! Yes, it's Pod Blast time. I'm your host, Chance Bartels, cutting it up with you tonight. Got a good one for you today, as Steve Harvey would say. Continuing the TV Mogul series, I'm going to talk about two big ones. And I've got a lot of good clips that I pulled for you guys and gals out there in the audience as we're live. The lines are not open yet, but if you want to call in later, the number is 770-438-1050. When I hold up the sign before the camera, that's when it's your cue to call in. If you're listening at fistfulofradio.com, don't worry about it. This is for folks on Facebook Live, YouTube, and stuff like that that are watching on camera. All right, so uh, you, heard, you know how I always start the show where I say, It's Pro Blast time! Well... I can't lay claim that that's like an original thing because that goes back to Howdy Doody time and the Howdy Doody show. That's my tribute to that. However, I noticed all of a sudden all these mainstream shows like this one all of a sudden kind of use my opening. Not being delusional, I know it's just a coincidence. There's not any writers out there that are stealing shit off the internet from people. No, no, not at all. But let's listen to this quick clip. Get this thing here going, right here, and see if this sounds a little bit familiar. All right, teams, here's your chance to add another 10 seconds to your time and $250 to your total. Because guess what time it is? What time is it? It's mini sweep time. That's on Supermarket Sweep, which is on a lot of Sunday nights, not every Sunday night, on ABC TV, owned by Disney. And I'm grateful, you know. I don't know if it's a coincidence or if there's some writer out there that's uh, tuning into the old pod blast. I mean, hell, we're everywhere. We're on Apple. We're on TuneIn. We're on uh, you know, all the major podcast platforms, plus YouTube and uh, fistfulofradio.com. Every Monday night at 7, every Saturday and Sunday, 2 p.m., and overnight every night. Fistfulofradio.com is where you can stream this show and a lot of other great shows, there's an NFL show called Pro Football Fast Break. They can't say NFL in the title because of licensing fees. The NFL wants their piece of the pie and they cut. So the show's just called Pro Football Fast Break. Then we got Saving Our America. Um, we got the Retro Zest show, which features a lot of real guests, entertainers and the like, actors and stuff. By the way, this very show is about to step it up in a big way. And uh, I'll have an announcement to make later. We have some big guests coming on. I'm really, really excited about. Uh, but the two main topics tonight. I mean, hell, you know who David Letterman is. And he was on TV this past week. Here we are in February 2022. And uh, he celebrated his 40th anniversary of Late Night with David Letterman on NBC, which debuted February 1st, way back in 19. 19- 82 and he made an appearance near his old studio not in the actual studio at rockefeller center in manhattan in new york city but we'll talk about that and have a clip of david letterman's return to late night television it was a very interesting interview now the other person besides david letterman that i'm going to feature tonight you probably don't know the name stephen j cannell but you actually do know who this person is Here's some quick audio to jar your memory. Anybody that's watched TV, like, for instance, the A-Team is an example. At the end of the show, during the end credits, you heard this little piece of music. It was a logo, and let me find that. Here it is. A 
again. Yeah, you saw this dude typing away at a typewriter, and he throws up a piece of paper, and it freezes into an animated shot onto a stack of papers, and it says, Stephen J. Cannell Productions. And uh, this guy won an Emmy for Rockford Files, and he was a really, really good writer and creator and co-creator of a lot of classic television shows that we'll talk about tonight on the Nostalgic with a C pod blast. Um, so let's see here. Uh, I do have a clip of him. He passed away in 2010. Like We talked about Glenn Larson and the cult TV mogul series recently. And by the way, on uh, Pod Co., it was by far my number one downloaded show. I mean, it went crazy on that platform. I can't check the Apple numbers. I wish I could, but um, it might be part of Apple. I don't know how that's factored in, but it just it went crazy. So I thought, let's talk about someone else. And down the line, we'll cover Aaron Spelling and some other TV moguls, big time people. And unfortunately, all these guys are like no longer with us of these major moguls. Um, mm, mm, mm. It's really sad, but their work is of course, immortal. So let me see right here. I want to, now that little sequence that I just played where he would type his, he was typing at the typewriter and he threw out the piece of paper and you heard that guitar riff. Uh, I want to play a one minute clip of the man himself from beyond the grave talking about that little logo and the origin of it. I should have it right here. Let's listen. The origin of the logo. Early part of the 80s, I was starting to be referred to as a television mogul. And I just kind of hated that. Because to me, a mogul was a guy in a green suit who tried to score actresses, you know? And I I kept saying that if I'm not a mogul, I'm a writer. I write every day for five hours. If that doesn't make me a writer, how do So I had a... um, a uh, publicist at the time who was working for my studio and we were right in the midst of trying to come up with a logo for the studio, a new logo for the studio. And she said, well, how about we do something with you as a typewriter? And I'm enough of a ham that I said, yes. And the great thing is, is wherever I go today, because I get recognized all over for that, wherever I go today, you know, people say to me, oh, you're the writer. So it's not you're the TV producer, you're the mogul, you're the writer. That's what I always wanted to be, was a writer. There you have it. Now, here is someone, a great composer of not just television, but you'll know him from television, Mike Post. He composed awesome music and main themes for shows like The Rockford Files, Magnum P.I., The Greatest American Hero, The A-Team, etc. And here's Mike Post talking about this gentleman, Mr. Cannell. Stephen J. Cannell, the genius idiot. Well, there's a lot of stories about that, but... I'll tell you the truth. My brother and I, before we could afford to take our vacations in Hawaii, we took our vacations at Balboa Island. I was married, my brother was married, uh, my brother had one child, and we had this house about two blocks off the beach. We couldn't afford a beachfront house. And on this Saturday, uh, my mother and father were going to come down. Some cousins were going to come down. We needed to stake out some territory on the beach. So we both got up kind of early and we walked down there. Now, my brother at the time weighed about 230 pounds. And I weighed 168 pounds, 160 pounds, something, about 160 pounds at the time. But we were both really yoked out. We were both buff. We were both valley guys. We were both... We also had had a couple of beers the night before, so we woke up at seven. We were a little edgy, I guess. We didn't say anything, you know, we just walked down the beach with all these towels. We jump over the seawall. Now it's cloudy out, seven o'clock in the morning. It's cloudy. I, I jump over the, right where we had told all these people we were going to meet them. There's all these towels spread out. I'm going, what in, what's going on here? So, but I said, well, I'm going to go over on the other side of the pier and see if I can. I said, bullshit, let's just move some towels. There's room for everybody here, you know. So I start moving these towels. All of a sudden I hear, hey! I, I don't see anybody. What the hell's going on? <laughs> Not talking to me. So I'm moving the towels. 
And I go, hey, you, quit moving my towels. And I turn around, and I look, and there's this great big opulent beachfront house. And there's this guy standing in the doorway smoking his thin little cigar with his iron jaw, and he just, his hair is sprayed. And I just don't like this guy right away. Right away, I'm going, oh, man, who is this jerk? So I said, you talking to me? He goes, yeah, quit moving my towels. I said, I'm not moving any towels. You must be blind. He goes, quit moving my, I mean, now he's red in the face, and he's screaming. And he's screaming like 50 feet away from me, 100 feet away from me. And I'm going, you know what? I don't think that. So I jump over the seawall. I start walking up. You know, OK, you know, OK. So I'm figuring, and the closer I get, the bigger this guy gets. I go, oh, shit, you know, OK. But I'm still pissed, and I'm still, like, not backing up. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, OK, I wonder what's going to happen here. So I hear my brother's whistle, and I, ah, he whistles. He goes, wait, stop. Now he comes running. And when you see this big, blonde neck like this bull coming at you, you know, it's like, OK. And when my brother says anything, I listen. Stop, stop, don't anybody do anything. So now he paddles up the walkway and I paddle up. Now I got my big brother with me. I mean, you know, this guy could have a howitzer. It's OK. So he goes up and butts says, look, he says, um, how big are you? I says, I'm 6'2". He said, well, he's 5'8". He said, but he's very tenacious. And he said, you know, he's probably going to be OK. He's probably going to get you. He said, but if he doesn't, so I'm going to send you to the hospital. So now, now what do you want to do? Guy looks at my brother, and I'm sitting there like like this, you know. Looks at my brother, he looks at me, he looks at my brother, he looks at me, and he, goes, and he goes back in the house. So I nod my head, and I go, okay, well, that was pretty easy. So we walk, we start walking. It took me about a half a block, and I just start feeling horrible. I go, oh, man, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to stop this? This is, you know, come on, okay, jeez. Whole morning, I just felt crappy. I told my wife, I dropped the flag on myself. Man, I was a jerk. I was a complete jerk to this guy. Lied to the guy, moved his towel. Blah, blah, blah. We go back down. Now he's down there with his family. He's got a little boy. His parents are there. You know, my parents are there. And I'm going, oh, God, this is awful. <laughs> this is just, I'm just a jerk. You know, I've got to turn over a new leaf. So uh, my brother starts talking to him. I, my brother said, hey, you know, we're sorry. He's, he's really a good guy. Said, yeah, he's really a good guy. He said, no, no, he's really. So now I go over and I introduce myself. I apologize. And, he, and I said, you know, I'm Mike Post. And he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I produce records. And I said, I'm a music director in the Andy Williams show. And he said, what records? I said, well, you know, first edition, classical gas. Blah, blah. My God, those are my favorite records. I'm like, oh, my God, you're so creative. And you're right. I said, yeah, you know, yeah. I said, what do you do? He said, oh, man. He said, you know, I'm trying to be a, a script writer. He said, but I've never sold anything. I said, well, that's a big ass house you got there. He said, well, my parents are filthy rich. He said, but I've never made a dime. And I said, well, geez. So now we start hanging out every day at the beach. And then we go water skiing and we go doing all this. And this guy's, this guy's a hell of an athlete. I mean, this guy can really throw the football. He's just a great athlete. And, and now it's, Readily apparent, this guy would have sent me to the hospital, you know, and except for my brother being there. And now we get to be really good. At the end of the two weeks, he says this line to me. I remember this like it was yesterday. He said, you know, if I could ever convince a producer that would buy a script of mine, if I could ever convince a producer, I think your music would be great, you know, behind drama on television or film. I said, hey, Steve, we're friends. I said, but I'm not going to do that. Te me on TV? <laughs> I'm in a rock and roll record business. I did the Andy Williams show a little, you know, that's a, you know, uh, that bought me a house, but I'm not, man, no way. I'm never doing that. I'm a genius. I'm just a genius, you know. I can just see the future so clearly. And of course, our careers together have been the best thing that ever happened to me. I hope good for him. I know good for him. And the greatest friendship. The greatest collaboration, because this, this fool, make no mistake, this is a fool we're talking about, that's a genius. This guy makes up stories that, and writes scripts that are, that are better than anybody. He is the absolute gorilla at that. He can write faster, better, smarter.
than anybody that was ever born for that medium, for that kind of television. And, you know, if you, if you take all of them, all the big guns, you take Wolf or Bochco or, or, you know, Milch or any, or David Chase or any of them, you wake them out of a sound sleep and go, are you scared of anybody? They go, Camel. Camel. I mean, and, you know, for him to make those stories up and come and say the most, the weirdest things to me. I said, well, what are you thinking about, Steve? Well, you know, I'm thinking about the Beach Boys. And then I go, oh, I, I know what he's talking about. You know, so that's why I said what I said about meetings. You don't have meetings with Steve Cannell. You just hang. And, you, and he'll just say some genius stuff to you that is that nobody else would say, that's so smart. And it may be only be a sentence. And he thinks it's stupid, you know, because he's down deep inside. He's insecure about messing with music. He's like, man, I don't know what I'm talking about. But he'll say something about as a film inventor. He's more than a filmmaker. He's a film inventor. And, and it'll just go, oh, man. And that's what he and Bochco and Wolf have in common. They're all really good at that with me. They're all really smart at that. So my career is really just, it all sprang from Cannell. I mean, he introduced me to Bochco and, and, you know, and Dick Wolf was, you know, was writing on, on, uh, on Hill Street. So that's the way all this happened, all from Cannell. It's a simple little career. It's just working for these three guys. It's not taking a bunch of meetings. It's not, people say, oh, you must be a great businessman because you've made it financially so good. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I don't have a price. I don't, I don't have a minimum. I don't, you know, you want me to do your show? I'll do your show. How much can you pay me? I mean, pay me whatever you can pay me. I don't care. I'm not doing it to, for the money. I'm, I mean, the money's great. I didn't start out doing it for money. I didn't, I'm not gonna end up doing it for money. I'm doing it for music. And, and the byproduct of that is, you know, is you want to do an interview with me and somebody wants to really look at this, and, and I've done a bunch of stuff that's maybe going to last a while, you know. That's Mike Post, courtesy of the Archive of American Television. You know, I just think there's not enough emphasis on television and behind-the-scenes stuff, and I want to change that. That's what this show is. The Nostalgic Pod Blast is a time capsule and an educational piece, and hopefully... A little bit entertaining, thanks to the clips, not me, along the way, along with the lesson. I don't want to be like a boring college professor and teaching a course in pop culture history. That's not what I want to do. But here's a brief overview of this man, Stephen J. Cannell. He was born in Los Angeles, California on Wednesday, February 5th, 1941. And Cannell was dyslexic. And you know what that means. It means he sees words backwards. So... Typically, people that are dyslexic have trouble spelling, have trouble reading. Uh, it's a learning disability, but he overcame that in a big way. He sold his first TV script for a show that starred Robert Wagner titled It Takes a Thief back in 1968 to Universal Studios. And Universal hired him as a freelance writer, creating scripts for Columbo, Ironside, and Adam 12 for Universal Television. And it, Cannell also created or co-created these shows, Chase, which only lasted from 73 to 74, The Rockford Files, starring James Garner, which lasted from 1974 to 1980 for six seasons, and Beretta from 1975 to 1978, which starred Robert Blake, City of Angels, 1976, and Bad Bad Black Sheep, 1976 to 1978. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, Stephen Cannell won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Drama Series in 1978 for The Rockford Files. And in fact, in that end credit logo sequence where he throws up the paper from his typewriter, in many of those shots, you'll see his Emmy Award right there in the background on the shelf. Kind of cool. Now, in 1979, Stephen J. Cannell left Universal Studios and formed his own production company, Stephen J. Cannell Productions. For the first few years, Cannell's office was located right there on the lot at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, California. Stephen Cannell's first series under this new banner was a show called Ten Speed and Brown Shoe back in 1980. 
and was soon followed by The Greatest American Hero in 1981, which ran until 1983. And again, Mike posted the theme. Look at what's happened to me. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, ugh, I can't sing for shit, obviously. And they also did The Quest in 1982, and then The A-Team, one of his most successful shows, which ran on NBC from 1983 until 1987. Then came Hardcastle and McCormick, which ran from 1983 to 1986. A show called Riptide started in 1984 and ran through 1986. And then a show called Hunter, which aired from 1984 to 1991. And then he relocated his offices to larger facilities on Hollywood Boulevard back in 1983. And many more series, such as a show called Renegade, starring Lorenzo Lamas, followed during the very prolific career of Stephen J. Cannell, who sadly died on Thursday, September 30th, 2010, at the age of 69. Oh, a quick Facebook comment. David Metter says, Bye Bye Black Sheep was the shit. And I agree. In fact, I'll play this for you, David. I'm just going to play some of the, uh, the theme tune. It has a very rousing theme tune to Bye Bye Black Sheep. By Mike Post, who you just heard earlier in the interview. He doesn't even look like I would expect. When I researched tonight's pod blast, I'd never seen what Mike Post looks like. And he's, he's bald. He looks like every man. He looks like a dude you'd see working in a, in a car lot or something or in a machine shop. He, just, he looks like an average Joe. But let's listen to a little bit of Bob Bob Black Sheep. We are poor little lambs. Who have lost our way? Ba, ba, ba. Bob Black Sheep by Mike Post. It's a very beloved show. It didn't last that long, lasted a couple years, but people sure as hell remember it. Now I'm going to play an interview from back in 85 with Stephen. Oh, God, what did I do with it? Stephen Canale. Stephen Cannell. Cannell. Where the fuck is it? Excuse my language. I did it again. I, where the frack is it? Oh, it's right here. This is from 1985, a KNBC interview with Stephen J. Cannell. And then move on to David Letterman. What are your indicators, that were the most reliable indicators, of whether or not a show is going to fly? I have none. I really have none. I don't know when I'm making a hit. I didn't know when the eight. The eight team is probably the biggest hit I've ever had. Out of about, I've had about six or seven hits, what I would call hits, some stronger than others. And the eight team is the biggest of all of them. And and when Frank Lupo, my co-creator, and I uh, were writing that script, all we knew was that it was different. We knew we liked it. We knew we enjoyed what we were doing, but we, and we knew it was different. And I kept saying to him, and he kept saying to me when we were at the script stage, he, I said, boy, I don't know how your end is coming, but my end is really strange, you know? <laughs> and they're either going to love this show or hate it, you know, because there's not going to be any in between. And in, in fact, that's what happened. I mean, you know, there are people who, you know, stay up, you know, for it and, and, and stay home for it, and there are other people who spit up on it. This falls just inside the category of trick question. What's your favorite show? Okay, I got a trick answer. The one I'm writing. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's funny. I, I have things about all of them that I that I uh, that I like, um, and, and different things. I mean, when I sit down to write Hardcastle and McCormick, I'm I'm writing a a, a father son relationship, which is something I've always really loved to write. Uh, that was, you know, the Rockford Files when I created that series when I put his father in it. I had so much fun writing that father son relationship. 
so I, I really enjoy that, that character relation. When I'm doing the, the A-Team, I have a lot of fun with the bizarre quality of the characters, which Hardcastle and McCormick don't have. So as a writer, I get to do different things when I, when I write different shows. You became a writer in spite of the fact that you had a pretty substantial handicap. Well, I mean, I don't know how substantial, uh, you know, it, it was. I mean, it was for me a hard thing because I'm a dyslectic. Mm -hmm. And for those people who don't know what that is, that's, uh, you have a tendency to reverse things, to be a mirror reader, to read slowly. And in high school and, and to a lesser extent in college, that was very troublesome to me because it was very hard for me to do science courses, very hard for me to do math. But writing was always real easy. What I couldn't do was spell because every time I'd see a word, I'd see it a little differently, and, and so nothing ever looked right to me. But the writing was very easy. I mean, I was always writing papers for friends, and then they, they would correct the spelling. I mean, I was always a good writer. But my English grades were always low because people, the, the professors would grade you off for spelling. It was just something I couldn't do and still can't. But at this point, I pay no attention to it, and, and uh, I just try and get the words down on paper, and, and, and they, they generally resemble the word that, that, that's in the dictionary. You know, so. Does that mean when you go back to all these high school reunions, people look at you and say, I can't believe you're doing what you're doing? Well, it's funny. I, I did go back to a high school reunion uh, after I had become quite successful at Universal before I set up my own company here. And I, had, you know, I had Rockford on the air, and I think Beretta and Black Sheep, and I had like three or four shows on. I went to the, and this English professor who had been flunking me when I was at this high school. He came up to me, kind of circled me for a while, and then he came up to me and he said, he leaned in and he said, uh, you, uh, you really make your living as a writer, don't you? <laughs> and it was just the reading was so great, you know, I was like, wow, can you believe that? That's from 1985. Again, that's from KNBC from back in 85. And, and the minute I'm going to do a little unboxing or un enveloping, I should say, of something I got from an actor that you know, Send it to me in the mail, and uh, I'm going to open that before the camera. If you're listening at fistfulofradio.com, this will be on video in the YouTube channel, The Nostalgic, with a C, not Nostalgia, The Nostalgic Pod Blast, or in the Facebook group, The Nostalgic Pod Blast. Now, uh, I'm going to play another interview with, with Stephen before we move on to David Letterman. I'll do the unboxing before we transition to David Letterman. But uh, before that, here is an interesting uh, version of the theme to the A-Team. That's probably his most popular show of all time. And I like the movie. I thought they did a good job with the reboot um, with Bradley Cooper. I really enjoyed the A-Team movie. It had a lot of good humor and it was well done. But uh, let's see. Yes, here is the Prague orchestra performing the theme to the a-team hope i can get away with this frog Film Orchestra. Now, uh, this is really quick. This is a, a band. This is a bunch of dudes that are probably younger than me, a rock band that are doing a cover <laughs> to the A-Team theme. It's only a minute long. It's like a home studio performance. This is uh, Mad Sonics. I'm going to play this, and then we'll move on. 
to a quick interview. Let me get this going here. Here we go. So uh, here is the last piece, I'm just doing kind of like a brief bio on Stephen J. Cannell. But here is an interview with him that I want to play on the Gregory Mantell show. And then we'll talk about something else. Here we go. God. I once was in a, in a squad car. We got a major 415 with knives and chains. That's a gang fight. And we went flying into this thing. You know what it was? And everybody, when, when they hit the scene, their adrenaline was pumping. Everybody had their gun out. You know, we thought we were going into a gang fight. It was two old men arguing over a garden hose. Huh. Today, Stephen J. Cannell is back to tell us about his new novel, The Three Shirt Deal. There's corruption in the LAPD. And he'll tell us about his new movie, The A-Team. Great to have you back Greg, again today, great Stephen. Great to be back with you. It's been a while. It, well, it's been, uh, what, a year? <laughs> we, we took a year off. Took we, a year we off. We took a, a book off. Now. I missed you last year. And I have some secret information about you. Uh-oh. I was talking to my friend Joanne Barron the other day, and um, the acting coach and actress. Right. And I was at her master class here in Santa Monica. And I said, you know, because I told her I was going to be interviewing you. And I said, you know, he used to always end his shows with the typewriter. And I said, well, you know, these days with computers, what does he do? She said that she called you or talked to your daughter in Hawaii. You were in the penthouse in Hawaii. You got that Hawaiian tan today. Yeah. And you had the typewriter shipped to you in Hawaii is what she told well, me. Well, I actually still write on a Selectric because, you know, I have learning disabilities. I have mm -hmm. severe dyslexia. And so spell check doesn't work for me. And, oh. you know, because every other word I, is misspelled. So when I hit the spell checker on my computer, it just smokes. Okay. So, so that's for me, a, you know, I just stayed on the Selectric, and I've got like 40 of these things. 40? Yeah, because so I figure, you you're know. You're keeping IBM in the typewriter business. I, and so I've, I've, and I've got years. a guy that fixes them for me, and, and uh, so when they, when they you know, there's 3,000 moving parts on a Selectric type, typewriter. It's amazing. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I take them. I usually take two, so I have a backup if one if one breaks. So it's in the luggage with you or something. Well, or well uh, yeah, I mean, it's what's well, not. In my, you can't put them in the luggage. Yeah. I take it separately and okay. packed in in foam and all of that. But yeah. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, don't be. It's uh, it's sort of silly, but you know, I, I should be writing on a computer. But there's something very old school about exactly hearing that ball hit the page, and I love doing it. I love I love writing. So. On would it, even without the dyslexia, would you still you think use a typewriter? Because you just sound old school with it. I mean, is that well? Is it more the you know, it is. A, it is the dyslexia, and it also is. The, it suits my writing process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like to write five or six pages, then sit back with my feet on my desk and a pencil in my hand and do a, a pencil edit, read it, mm -hmm. read it over. And this is my rough draft, which is all misspelled because it's all spelled phonetically uh -huh. because of my learning differences, and then send it into my secretaries. And I go back and I write another five pages. And then I sit up and I'm with my feet on the desk and I do a pencil edit on that and send that in. So if I can write like 15 pages a day, okay. and, and, and I like that to do it that way. And if I, if I do it on a computer and I put that cursor in and start to do my rewrite 
I'm so fast on a keyboard, all of a sudden I'm doing my second draft right on top of my first draft. Uh, and I don't want to So you do can't that. refer back, it's just gone. I really rather, yeah, I just really rather have the first draft, do the pencil edit, send it in, it's basically a first draft, then look at it tomorrow and see what did I do, and then do a, a second draft on it tomorrow. So. Okay. That's, uh, that's well. My uh, scholars and historians will love you because they keep saying that you know so many modern writers these days. They'll you know how they like to go through and look at all their drafts and versions of things. For a lot of writers these days, they they won't even have that luxury because with the computer, there is only one version in effect for a lot of people. Yeah, unless you save it. Right. You know, you know, which, the other thing so I you know, found when I was when I ran my television studio and I had six shows on there and had all these writers working for me, and I would give some notes to a writer and I'd say. You know this this character. I, I'm not feeling his heart. I, you know we need to get a little more sensitivity. And so they'd find a scene, open it up, put in six lines of sensitivity, and close it again. <laughs> and that would be it. That would be the rewrite. And I go, no, 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 no. It's got to like in, in, inundate his character all the way from the beginning through the end of the material. You got a lot of rewriting to do here. You can just open this up and put six lines in. You know, and and that's what I think in, people that are writing on computers have a tendency because it's so simple. To, to, to mess with the stuff and move stuff around and everything like that. Whereas sometimes when you give a note like that, what you're really saying is I need a little bit here, a little bit here, all through the script, mm -hmm. you know, so it's... But not just exactly not just that. that. The other thing that impresses me about you is just your work ethic. I mean, you could be retired, you don't have to be doing this, but you're up every morning at what, 5 a.m. still, right? Uh, it's right? a little earlier than 5, five right? How early? Well, I get up about 3.30. 3.30? And I lift for an hour. Because I, I, I oh, so you go to the gym first. I, I have a gym in my basement, and I go down there, and okay. I I crank it off for like an hour, really a hard workout, oh. and then I I go up to my office and I read yesterday's pages, and I'm usually at, starting new work by six o'clock. Six o'clock. Five thirty, something like that. And what what time do you finish then? What time are you? Oh, about eleven, eleven thirty. Eleven. Okay. You know, and then I'm and then I'm into the office, and I'm usually have a business meeting. Mm. Go on. You know, I'm there. making movies, and I'm doing other things as well as writing novels, and and so yeah. You know, what, what time do you go to bed then if you're getting up at three thirty? Well, m my wife would tell you too early, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I, I I I go to bed around nine thirty, ten o'clock. Okay. Three thirty. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's what it takes to. Well, it's what it was my. You know what? I don't. I don't recommend that for other people. Uh, but, but you really do. I mean, that's the reason. I mean, you've written so many books, TV shows. I mean, you wrote everything. I, the volume. Your, the volume alone of what you've done over the years is just incredible. But it's, I guess, because of that work ethic. I mean, you have to treat it like a job, a nine to five job. And well, you know what? It's, even, it's <laughs> even more more than that, Greg. You know, it's the joy. The joy that I get doing it is I cannot explain to you how much fun it is for me. So you're happy to get oh, the 3.30. I love it. It's the best part of my day. It's one of the reasons I keep, I mean, my wife keeps saying, you know, you, are you getting up already? You know, I, sometimes I, <laughs> I like have to lay in bed until 4 so that she won't be mad at me, you know. But, you know, but because I do, I get up, because it, I wake up and I'm like, I'm pumped to get going. And, um, you know, so it's, it, you know, it's, for me it's been, a, it's been a joy. So it isn't, I don't drag myself to the typewriter. I'm not one of those writers who loves to be interrupted. Uh, I have friends where you call them up, they're writers, and, and he said, I, and I interrupt your writing, yeah, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you know. <laughs> I'm not that way. I, when I pick up the phone, if you call me during my writing hours, I, I answer like this, what? <laughs> <laughs> Don't call when I'm I mean, writing, that's because you know? I'm really protecting that time, because I really, it's my most important time of my day. So are you, you're doing, what, about a novel a year now? Is it? Uh, yeah, and this year, two. Two? When, yeah. When's the next one? Uh, July. Can you tell me what the next one is? Uh, it's called At First Sight. And uh, it's a standalone. It's not a Shane Scully. It's a standalone okay, okay. novel, and it's a very different piece of work. Okay. Well, will you send me that one? I'm looking. I will. That I'll one. send it to you. Okay. Great. Now, this one, your your main guy is a, a Shane Scully, the LAPD officer. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious. I just interviewed a police officer last night, by the way, and I'm I'm not anti police, but of course, doing this sort of a thing, you hear all kinds of things about the police, and you you sort of have that. I mean, on the one hand, your main character is a police officer, <clears throat> but yet you talk a lot about police corruption or internal politics and everything. What's your... What's my take on cops? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, LAPD or cops in general? You know, I, I'm, I'm very pro-police. Hmm. And I've spent a lot of time in the backs of police cars. And that hmm. isn't to say... Now arrested or... No, 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 no. <laughs> well, I mean, when I was a kid, I got, I got popped a couple of times. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 you know I, I, I do ride-alongs. And, and, and before I write, like I, I did a book on the Anti-Terrorist Bureau of the LAPD. So I yep. wanted to get into the ATB before I... I, I did that book and uh -huh. it took me forever to 
convince them that I w that I was okay to, to go in there. <laughs> That's what I wondered. If yeah, they because like because Kevin obviously the last thing they want is a writer in the anti-terrorist bureau, <laughs> you know. But uh, they, I finally got in and I rode around in the suburbans with those guys and I, I got a chance to, and it's it, it's an interesting thing, you know. There's there's two sides of it. There mm -hmm. there are, you know, there are there are some cops that are drawn to police work because they love the action. Mm -hmm. You know, they love the dust-ups. They love, they love getting into it. The, maybe the drama. I don't know. And, so. You know, and, and there are some cops that are that are drawn to the violence. Hmm. You know, and 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 so, but they aren't. I would say the majority of the people operating on the LAPD. Who knows what motivates somebody to to want to do that kind of work? I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why people do it. Sure. My own feeling is is that if you're in a in a uh, in a squad car and you get a um, a major call, a red light and siren call, uh, you know, um, officer needs help, shot fired, or officer down yep. call, which I, I've been in squad cars where, where we got that call. Really? And, uh, and, and you're flying to this scene, and you're, it's code three, which means red light and siren. You're breaking red lights on the city streets. You're going 80 miles an hour. You know, it's a white knuckle flight, and you hit the scene. And you pile out. You don't know who's what, where, what. You know, you don't know who made the call. You don't know where the heavies are. You don't know where if there even are heavies there. We went. I once was in a in a squad car. We got a major 415 with knives and chains. That's a gang fight. And we went flying into this thing. You know what it was? And everybody, when when they hit the scene, their adrenaline was pumping. Everybody had their gun out. You know, we thought we were going into a gang fight. It was two old men arguing over a garden hose. <laughs> And and you know the call just got fumbled by 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 the wow. by the he could have got shot with a guard somebody could have got <laughs> shot you know so you know and and I'm I'm telling you my heart was going mm -hmm. like that you know because so are you no offense but are you hiding behind the back seat or are you no 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 you, you know you have to kind of know what to do when you're in a police car because if you're in an important situation you got to bail out of the car because squad cars draw fire. Hmm. So do they would just let you out or you jump out or well, something? Well, you, know, you basically sign a waiver, you know, and oh. then they, they, they say to you, I once got into a shooting in Rampart, and I, I, was, I testified at the shooting review board. Hmm. It's a fascinating thing because these guys will hit, hit a scene like this, and now they have to make split-second se life-or-death decisions in the field that are going to be argued in court right. for like two months. And if they're wrong, they can go to jail, these, you know, and so... And then on the other side of the issue, you have the victims, people who are maybe, you know, um, injured or in some way um, uh, misrepresented by the law. Right. And, and, and you know, and, and they got a good beef too. So you know, it's a, it, you know, you're 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 dealing with a very difficult situation. And but it, but where do I come out? I really come out that it's a, it's one of the toughest jobs that somebody can sign up for. And. Um, and the good cops, and I know a lot of really good cops who really go out of their way, you know, to make sure it's done right and, and to protect the public, regardless of where that public is, whether it's in, in, in South Central, whether it's in Rampart Division, or whether it's in Beverly Hills. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll pick up on that in just a second. We'll be right back. And we are back with Stephen J. Cannell today talking about his new novel, Three Shirt Deal, The Three Shirt Deal. So in this book, um, your cop is the good guy. Yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's, he, he is a, a little bit of a walk alone, this guy, and, and so which makes him fun. And he's married to, his wife Alexa runs the Detective uh, Services Bureau of the LAPD, so she's in charge of the entire detective division. Uh -huh. So he works for his wife, which creates an interesting kind of... Um, dynamic in the book, in all the books. Um, and in this particular novel, he's approached by uh, a, a, an internal affairs detective, a woman named Cicada Yavar, a Hispanic woman, a really beautiful gal. Mm -hmm. And she approaches him, and, and internal affairs is charged or tasked with the job of, of investigating bad due process cases. If, uh -huh. if you were arrested, sent to prison, and you claim that your case was not adequately investigated, and you complain, then that complaint I'd be complaining. Can, you would be complaining. <laughs> that that would go to Internal Affairs, and they investigate the investigation, and 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 that's called a bad due process case because you you were denied your due process under the law, and so that's what this is. And this guy who was accused and and convicted of killing his mother for two hundred dollars to buy crystal meth. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a tweaker murder. It's you know he's a you know he's a when loser. I lived in Chicago, there was a case in the news. True story. Um, 
kids kill their grandmother for twenty dollars for drugs. So two hundred dollars is probably got a, more a, than, more a, a than upscale than crime, yeah. you know, from where you live. <laughs> and, and so he, he ends up getting into this thing, and it, and this this tweaker murder, it, you know, actually is hiding a huge corruption inside the LAPD that stretches from the mayor's office to the West Side power brokers in in Beverly Hills and. And uh, involves uh, an old enemy of Shane's, who is on the LAPD, who's the head of the detective division in Van Nuys. He runs the detective bureau in Van Nuys, and and he is uh, a real bad guy. And Shane uh, now, knows now he's a bad based guy. Based on all your your ride-alongs and your dealings with the, the police, is is this based on? I mean, is it just kind of a general compilation or something I, specific? I picked it or? up from two cases that oh. actually happened. Really. Uh, and then I, 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 I adjusted it and fictionalized it. One was a, a, a case, a guy named Bruce Lisker, hmm. who was accused of killing his mother for $200 to buy meth, hmm. and, and claims that, that he was framed by the LAPD. Hmm. And, uh, was he? Uh, maybe. Hmm. I mean, there's a big, I mean, if you go onto the internet and look him up, you're going to see there's a, you know, he, I think he's currently just been granted a new trial. Oh, well, so he's still in prison. He's in jail, yeah, in jail. But, but the Internal Affairs Division has been investigating it, investigating the police, you know, investigation, and uh, whether he was framed or not, or whether they just jumped on him because he looked like a good suspect, and he was, he was a tweaker, and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't all there, and he, he copped, he copped to it to get out of what he thought was going to be a death penalty situation. Right. And, and you kind of talk about some of the shortcomings of even not just the police, but sort of the legal system in general, where there are those kind of, you know, <sighs> we'll take the police so you don't face the death. You know, if somebody doesn't have a lot of money or has a public defender and... Yeah, you can and, kind and, of you know, about the PD's system. office, their, their job is to get rid of these cases. You know, there, there are thousands of them going through the system, and so if you can pre, uh, plea bargain a case off, this guy cops to a first degree, you know, murder case, uh, a 25 to life murder case, so he could be out in 17 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like okay, that's done. It's 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 out of the system now. We can nice move, on to, move on to the next case. And, and in fact, he probably sh he claims he shouldn't have ever been even arrested. So, well, what's the other case this was based on? The other case, I was fascinated when I remember the guy here in LA not too long ago that crashed the million dollar Enzo Ferrari. Yes. Yeah. On PCH. On PCH. Cut it in half. It, and walked away, which is a pretty good ad for the Enzo Ferrari, by the way, because <laughs> he was doing 115 or something when he rolled it. Yeah. And and when the CHP or whoever was, I think it was the Sheriff's Department, when they were investigating this case, you know, and he's still, he, this guy just gets out of the car and he's standing on the roadside and he's making cell phone calls and he's three sheets to the wind, he's just drunk. And, and, and he has a badge in his wallet, wallet and, he, and he badges these guys and he says he's a police officer with the with a little bus company transit authority and that he worked for Homeland Security. And the cops there were going, oh, this is, a, is in, in the real case, And this happened. is the real case. Okay, because happened. that happens in the book, but in yeah, the real I, case. that's why okay. I borrowed it. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and the cops are going, oh, he's a brother officer, you know, so, you know, we'll, we'll release him on his own recognizance. He blew a, a, a number on the, on the breathalyzer and everything. But, and then two other guys show up, and they have these same bus company badges. And I'm, think, I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking, what kind of police power do, <laughs> Does a bus company cop, a private, you and I could form a bus company and then we could form a police department. Let's do have, it. I kind of like badges this idea. <laughs> and run around with guns and badges and we, ha and we actually would have police power. And get money from Homeland Security or you, in the book. And really. <laughs> so I, I got very interested in that. And, 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 and I decided I would, I would weave that into my story. Do you know, now I know what the angle is in the book, but what was the angle in real life? Was I, there, I, was I there anything? The, the angle in the book. Ah. Is my take on what was really going oh, on? Oh, so you think there was something I, I kind can't of shady? Prove it. I can't okay. prove it. Okay, but that's my take on what I think was going on. Okay. <laughs> well, now also talking about the book, though, there's another twist to this. Um, as I say, with your your tan here, you look like you just came back from St. Bart's. But I um, did. Oh, you did. That's right, you did. Yeah. I just was and, back a day ago. And you, so you must like it a lot there. I, you know, I, I go there every year after my book tour. Uh, mm -hmm. After a month on the road, my wife and I you know, escape to that island, which I really like, and we've been doing it for years. And that's where this book idea kind of came from. Part of it came from there. I met a, a friend of mine on the beach that I've known all, over the years that, that stays at the same uh, resort that we do and comes every, every year at the same time. And he and I were talking on the beach, and he told me some very interesting things about a carton manufacturing company that I, I used in this novel.
And that does, I don't, I guess, well, am I giving away too much? Should I? No, no, it's okay. okay. I mean, uh, because uh, on the one hand, no, you may think carton manufacturing, that doesn't sound very interesting. But what, what is interesting well, about it? Well, it's the million dollar prize mm -hmm. scrape offs that, you know, the, that, that were, were if you have a package and, and you sell it to somebody and they, and, they, and they know that there's a contest, he scrapes it off and, oh my gosh, I won, I, I got the winning number, I can collect this from the, from the product manufacturer for a million dollars, and uh, or get a new Hummer or whatever the prize <laughs> is. So, um, you and know, it, that's that's kind of what's it, it's it's a piece of this novel. And he, so there's a whole system they have for like verifying that people yeah. number one actually win the prizes because people yeah. may think that it's just a gimmick or a publicity stunt. They don't really give away the money. And right, no, it's so. it's uh, it, it's it's a very it, what was interesting about it was what how much I didn't know about it. Yeah. So when this guy is telling me all this stuff, which I I won't give away here, but it's fascinating the way, and it really affects this whole murder mystery of this novel. Do you think this kind of thing could happen in real life, or has happened, without giving uh, away too much? But w w well, I think there is a, there certainly is the possibility to rip off one of these prize contests, mm. and I and I really think that um, one of the reasons that they go to all the trouble that they go to to try and protect the integrity of the contest is because they probably have been ripped off. Mm. That's Has right. It's that happened, look at McMillions, which aired on HBO. It was a great six-part series. True story. Remember the McDonald's Monopoly game? Well, there was a family in the state of Georgia, where I'm at right now, that ripped off McDonald's to the tune of millions of dollars. See McMillions. It's really interesting. So God bless this guy. He made such a difference in pop culture. He really did. And a good, good writer, excellent writer, Stephen J. Cannell, who passed away sadly on September 30th, 2010, at the age of 69 years old. Item! A couple shows back in our cult TV mogul series that I did about Glennie Larson, I talked about a Glennie Larson show that you don't see anymore. It's not ever been released on home video. Uh, it's never been... Uh, streamed anywhere it's not even on me tv or antenna tv or any of those diginets that focus on classic television it was this show and i talked about it last time and i have something from a star of this show i want to share with you that i received in the mail Right, that was The Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo, which was a spinoff of BJ and the Bear. And one of the main stars of that show was an actor named Mills Watson. And he played the bungling deputy Perkins. And at first, in the first episode and pilot of BJ and the Bear, he was a badass. He was, a you know, kind of like in Dukes of Hazard. Roscoe P. Coltrane was played straight in the beginning. He was a tough lawman, and then they made him a buffoon. That's the same thing with this character. Well, you know, when I was gonna, when I was researching, God, I'm having a terrible hum here. I hate that bad audio. When I was researching the Glenny Larson pod blast that I did, I tried to locate Mills Watson with the help of a friend, and I did locate his address. He's living in Oregon State. That's all I'll say. I'm not gonna invade this man's privacy. But um, I reached out to him, and he got back to me the next day in the form of his assistant, who I think was probably his wife, but I don't know. I, I, I had a, a phone number, and I called. I got voicemail, and it was definitely him on the greeting. And I just said, hey, I'm Chance with the Nostalgic Podblast. I'd love to interview you. And then the next day, I got a call from a woman, and she said, I'm calling on behalf of Mills Watson. Uh, unfortunately, he does not do interviews. Which is true. There's nothing in print, nothing I've seen on YouTube or anywhere. No, no digital interview, nothing on video. 
And back in the day when Lobo and the Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo, Lobo was the season two title, was on the air, I didn't see anything with him. I saw uh, the main star, Claude Akins, who played the Sheriff Lobo, you know, the star of the show. I saw plenty of interviews with him, but nothing with Mills Watson. So when she gave me the unfortunate news, he doesn't do interviews. That's just his personal policy. I said, oh, shucks, because when I called, I said, I'd at least like to buy an autograph. And so she acknowledged that. And she said, when I spoke with her, however, Mills will be happy to send you an autograph photo. So I'm going to open it now before the camera. If you're listening at fistfulofradio.com, you can't see this, obviously. But if you're watching live on Facebook or on YouTube, let's, let's open this. Uh, I want to see what this looks like. I've been waiting. I got this a couple weeks ago. And I forgot in the last pod blast about overweight comedians and funny, famous, fat people. I meant to open it then, and I, I forgot. So let's open this now and see what he sent me. I'm opening it now. Let's see. Mills Watson. Ah! High chance, Mills Watson. Rose! That's kind of how he talked. Let me see if you can get this on the camera there. I'm going to get that boy. He had a couple catchphrases. I can't say his catchphrases caught on like, say, Flo and Alice. Kiss my grits. But he did have some funny catchphrases. He was always at odds with uh, Deputy Birdie, who was the straight man, who was uh, the college kid, and who was always by the book. And this guy, along with Sheriff Lobo, they ran scams together. And uh, in fact, I mentioned this last time, this character, Perkins, he married <laughs> the sister of Sheriff Lobo, who was oh, just a very tall, unattractive woman. <laughs> and so he was always trying to scam on other women and play around. And it never worked out. But there was one episode that I loved. I love that picture. Thank you. I, I don't know if Mills Watson will ever see this. I'm going to send him something in the mail to at least compensate him for his postage and, and give him a little extra scratch. Uh, not that he needs it. I'm not, I'm, that's not the point. It's just, I feel really obligated. Um, cause he sent me that, you know, for free. It's kind of cool. So there was one episode I talked about, um, from season one of the misadventures of Sheriff Lobo that I really loved. It featured his character and it's called hail, hail, the gangs all here. And that's where a, like a biker gang has invaded Orley County, Georgia. And he, and actually supposed to be, the good cop, uh, Birdie, infiltrating the biker gang. But see, this guy, uh, Perkins, doesn't want to have any, this guy one-up him, the college boy. So he decides to go in himself, incognito. And it's funny as hell, I think, because he shows up on a fat boy. And he's accidentally doing donuts, but the biker gang thinks he's a badass. They're like, look at this loco, look at this crazy dude. And he winds up getting hit over the head, which is a corny plot device for television. Usually it results in amnesia. And then the person gets hit on the head again. And they're normal. Uh, even in Batman, you had this character, uh, King Tut, the Pharaoh, played by Victor Bueno. And he would get hit, hit on the head. He was a college professor. And when he got hit on the head, he would become this villain. And then he'd get hit on the head again. And he was a college professor. Oh, my. What happened? Where am I? Well, Perkins gets hit on the head, and he becomes this total badass. I am going to play a little clip, and then we're going to talk about David Letterman. And I have some great audio from David Letterman. Let me see if I can get this clip to play right fast, quick. You're listening to the Nostalgic Pod Blast. I'm Chance Bartels, your host. And, yes, this is from that episode. The audio quality is going to be a little, little much. It's not going to be great. Yeah. It's all I could find. I have it in awesome quality, but I didn't have a chance to pull the clip. Hang on a second. Here. All right. He becomes the skull when he's hit over the head, and he's a total badass, man. I don't know nothing about no birdies. Now stand aside. I don't like talking to people who still have all their front teeth. Well, oh, wait, no, I can't take you to the hospital. You must have gotten hurt. A skull hurt? <laughs> Boy, are you out of it, Crouch. But if you're so fond of hospitals, I'll be glad to arrange a little trip to the emergency room for you. Now, get out of the way. I'm going into town. Sick of this sissy bar. Move. <laughs> Don't 
Don't let the track kind of it's kind of hard to convey this without some video, but uh, it was just a really good episode. It's on YouTube, and it's really, really funny. Uh, hail, hail, the gang's all here. The Adventures of Sheriff, the Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo. So thank you to Mills Watson Perkins himself for sending me that autographed picture. That's pretty cool. Ah, so, item. Back on February 1st, 2022, Late Night with David Letterman on NBC turned 40. Back in 1982, it had replaced The Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder at 12.30 a.m. on NBC. Bill Murray was the first guest, but before that, Dave was a guest host for Johnny Carson on NBC starting in 1978. And I'm going to play a clip. There's not much video out there that survives of David Letterman guest hosting The Tonight Show, but I found a clip from June 4th, 1981. I hope the audio is decent. Let's see, I should have tested it. Shame on me. But uh, here is a clip of Dave's monologue from The Tonight Show from about, let's see, this would be about eight or nine months before Late Night with David Letterman started. And before that, he had a morning show, a uh, 90-minute show that was live on NBC. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, here is David Letterman guest hosting The Tonight Show. Let me get this to go for you. David Letterman, welcome to The Tonight Show. Now, before we actually begin the show, there is something that I should say. Uh, it's just kind of a little nuisance. Uh, you may have read about it. There's a little health problem here in Los Angeles, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, trivial uh, by comparison to other things. But the NBC nurse here did want me to ask you folks, how many of you are here for the free brain fever inoculations? <laughs> Good, nice to have you here. It's a little uh, 98 degrees here in uh, lovely Burbank, and as a result of that, uh, those of you who may be warm in the studio audience, relax, because during the commercials, the NBC pages will come up there and lick you to help try and cool things down. <laughs> what a wonderful show we have for you folks this evening. Doc Severinsen is here. Uh, uh, Ed McMahon is not with us tonight. He's home spit polishing his nose. Over here, Tommy Newsom, ladies and gentlemen, and the NBC orchestra. Uh, Tommy and I went to dinner last night. Uh, he likes going to McDonald's because he likes the uniforms, but we didn't go there last night. Um, we, we went to a different place, and uh, it was pretty exciting. He has some wonderful news. He's uh, just been named to the Inanimate Object Hall of Fame, and so we're all very, very proud and happy. For uh, dessert, it was uh, interesting. It's not what I would have ordered for dessert, but uh, he had the baked Ohio. And uh, <laughs> baked Ohio, yeah, it's kind of a, a switch. That's what we call a switch, as opposed to the baked. There you go. See how much fun comedy is. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. <laughs> I heard some uh, interesting information with regard to crime in these great United States. Um, apparently now, New York City is number seventh as far as crime statistics go in this country. Los Angeles is number two. And <laughs> a, a note of pride coming from the band with it. Uh, by God, we're proud of it too. We'll be number one next year, Dave. Uh, the number one place for crime in this country, as it turns out, is any 7-Eleven store. Now, I thought that was a... No, it's just a joke, just a joke there. Uh, the other unbelievable thing that I heard, and uh, I keep hearing this over and over again, so I don't know if it's true or I don't know if it's just hype, but they now claim, authorities, that New York tap water tastes better than any other tap water... See, um, I lived in New York for about eight months, and uh, I found that the only good thing about New York tap water, on a hot day, you have friends over, and you don't feel like making a, a big fuss. 
pour them some glasses of New York tap water, chances are they're going to think it's iced tea. See, that's about the <laughs> thing <to> say. <laughs> uh, here's some advice for you. Um, it's about that time of year where I have to make my uh, annual trip to the DMV. Do you know what that is? The Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, here in Los Angeles, let me give you a piece of advice. If a relative or a loved one, husband, spouse, whatever, turns up missing two or three, four days, before you call the police, check one of the lines at the DMV, all right? Because, um, now, I had to uh, take my driver's test again. Now, this is interesting. The woman on the other side of the counter, who is now going to grade my driver's test, uh, appears to have successfully avoided any formal education, you know? And, uh, she, <laughs> she, no. And uh, well qualified for the job. She looks like she may have spent several years living in the trunk of a Buick, so she'll be... <laughs> She'll be grading my test. Now, uh, the interesting thing, you go there, this, I believe, is the last place on the face of the earth where you can witness adults trying to cheat <laughs> on a written examination, you know? <laughs> I'm standing behind a guy who is about the size and shape of a silo, see? And he says to me, he's looking over there, and he says, you know, number five there, number five, where it says uh, address, what'd you, what'd you put for that one? <laughs> So that's a little bit of his monologue when he was guest hosting The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. So he got his own morning show. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's flash forward. This is eight months after that monologue, and this is February 1st, 1982. Now, Dave's NBC studio in New York City was at Rockefeller Center, Studio 6A. That's the same building where about a decade before the Mark Goodson, Bill Todman syndicated game show hit to tell the truth was taped in the 1970s and that had dave's original announcer original announcer bill wendell who also uh, did to tell the truth now i'm going to play a little bit of the theme of to tell the truth because i like this theme song and by the way you can see to tell the truth i love this show with, with, with the real Bill Wendell, please stand up. And this show lasted in many arc incarnations for decades. Even Alex Trebek hosted a version of it in the early 1990s. But I want to play, this is the 1973 theme. And this airs every morning, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on Buzzer, which is a national network. And it's also on uh, Pluto TV. There's a Buzzer channel. But I love this theme. I'm going to play a little bit of this. And this was in the same building that Dave Letterman had his NBC late night show. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Moore. And you heard Bill Wendell introducing the host, Gary Moore. And here's the actual musical piece, the theme to, to tell the truth.
So flash forward about 10 years, and this is what the very first episode of Late Night with David Letterman sounded like on February 1st, 1982. This guy introduced it. Let's see here. Let me go. <laughs> Larry Bud Melman. Remember this character? There's no studio audience. Just a strange... Good evening. Certain NBC executives feel it would be a little unkind to present this show without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold a show featuring David Letterman, a man of science who sought to create a show after his own image without reckoning upon God. It's one of the strangest tales ever told. I think it will thrill you, it may shock you, it might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you don't care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now's your chance to, well, we've warned you. All these women dressed as peacocks, these dancers, these gorgeous dancers are on camera now. From New York, one of the most exciting cities in the tri-state area, it's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight's guests are Bill Murray, Don Mr. Wizard Herbert, also a tour of the set, a special Late Night report on the shame of the city, and the Rainbow Grill Dancing Girls. And now, a man who shouldn't be up this late, David Letterman. Thank you. That's very kind of you, and welcome to our show. It's late night, and uh, I guess you know spring is just around the corner in New York City when the peacock girls start to molt. It's uh, not unlike the swallows returning to Capistrano. It's a festivity here every year in New York. Uh, welcome to the show. You folks are apparently a bright group, bright enough at least to read the applause sign, and I certainly, I certainly appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this new show, and uh, it's a big uh, three or four days for NBC. Um, uh, now, so, uh, let's see, uh, they of course had World War III last night, starting on the, uh, and then the Saturday night Eric Estrada was singing, and, uh, and, and tonight this extravaganza, but the whole thing was, was kind of uh, tainted, uh, I believe it was Friday evening, an NBC executive uh, on his way home, was arrested at Grand Central Station. Uh, his, his pride was showing. So they <laughs> held him uh, So that entire first episode is on YouTube, uh, if you just look it up. And so the announcer I talked about, Bill Wendell, I want to play a little bit of an interview early on on Late Night with David Letterman. I think he's an interesting character. And he was, again, the original announcer until 1995. He uh, made it to the CBS version, um, the late show with David Letterman as well, before he retired. 
But let me play this for you. I, I just think this is interesting because I love announcers with good voices. We'll like bring you this fine television program. A man who has put in a lot of years in this business, the voice of late night, our own Mr. Bill Wendell. Bill! <laughs> Bill, uh, first of all, let me, we, uh, we came across this in our research. This is, uh, first of all, it's a, a card, looks like a, a postal card. Tell us what we're looking at here. This is... That's uh, Mr. Adventure. Mr. Adventure. Yeah. And what, why were you dressed as Mr. Adventure, Bill? To put a couple of kids through school. This, this was uh, Bill Wendell, Mr. Adventure, and his Serial Theater Day. That's right. At Palisades Amusement Park, New Jersey, Saturday, July 18th, 1953. Right. You had a regular show as Mr. Uh, Adventure? Right. And July 19th, Palisades Amusement Park closed for good. Closed it up forever. Yeah. That, what, where was that? Was that on the old, uh, not the amusement park? Park, but Dumont Television. Yeah. Dumont Television, years ago. Well, you we just a... uh, showed, car, you know, Buck Rod. Dumont. They also had the Jackie Gleason show before it went to CBS in 1952. So this, I guess, would be in the 1950-51 season. Let's listen. So whatever it was, and I spoke to the kids. We got like 17,000 letters a week. And... Spoke to the kids? Yeah. What kind of things would you tell the kids, Bill? Oh, you know, don't beat your dog and <laughs> things like yeah, that. Yeah, you can't go too far wrong with that. No, incidentally, I, you told me this afternoon, I was shocked to hear that, that you and your dog, Bob... The same uh, doctor. ...go yeah. to the same doctor. Now, Bill... Um... <laughs> Before we go on, Dave, uh, is it a real doctor, or do you both go to the vet? He's recognized in some states. Now, Bill, uh, when we had Edie Adams on here a while yeah. back, yeah. Uh, you also were telling us about your uh, working with Ernie Kovacs. And uh, again, give us an idea of what he was like to work with. Uh, number one, he was a charming man. Yeah. He truly was. He was a friend, worked with him for a couple of years. Uh, he was the world's worst poker player. Ernie would draw three cards to an inside straight. And uh, that's that's bad. That's very bad. Yeah. And uh, he spent money all the time. You guys would uh, gamble right before the show, after the show, and uh, sometimes during during the show. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've done my share of gambling during the show oh, also. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> we played the Hudson Theater, which was an old theater on 45th Street off of Broadway. Uh -huh right after rehearsal and we didn't rehearse much it was just the singers would come out and play with the band bang the curtains would close the audience would start in and we'd put an orange crate behind this the screen and we'd start to play poker and i'll give you my word one night there were about six of us playing poker around this orange crate and the hudson theater was an old theater it was like three stories up into the wings high and an electrician was up there tightening one of the lights, and he dropped a pair of electric pliers, you know, with the tape on sure. it. They must weigh about three or five pounds. It came down, and it hit no more than two feet from where we were sitting at the orange crate. And Ernie just looked over as that thing went whap. Looked back at us, and he said, whose deal is it? <laughs> that was the wildest thing. Unfazed. Was, unfazed at all. We have some uh, old film of you and Ernie Kovac, and I'm not sure what it is. Why don't you tell us what we're going to take a look at? I think we're going to have uh, a little bit of a thing that we used to have a great deal of success with called the Question Man. The Question Man. Right. From I, I would read the questions uh, or the answer, and uh, Ernie would go on from there. Okay. This was the first time this was ever done, incidentally. This has resurfaced in many different forms. It has it? indeed. And uh, what year, roughly, would this have been from? Mid-50s. Okay. Ernie Kovacs and uh, our own uh, Mr. Adventure, Bill Wendell, <laughs> and the Question Man, folks. Good morning, and welcome to another session with Mr. Question Man. All questions received by Mr. Question Man are carefully tabulated, and some of them are filed. Our question from a lady interested in the ancient past, Mrs. Genevieve Hoban of Dallas, Texas, writes, Dear Mr. Question Man, what was the name of the paper used by the ancient Egyptians? The Cairo Evening Times. <laughs> the question man, Now, you have worked uh, with a lot of folks in television and even radio. Yeah. As we take a look at these photos, Bill, tell us a little bit about the person and the, the circumstance. Here's a gentleman that uh, just passed away recently, uh, Dave Garraway. And this was the show. This picture was out of the New York Post. Uh, this was 
really one of the great shows of television just starting, Wide Wide World. Now, is this, in this picture, I guess this was part of your job, periodically you'd walk up to Mr. Garraway and say, uh, Dave, how do you pronounce this word? Is that... <laughs> yeah, and Dave also had a dog, and he'd go to the same doctor. All right. <laughs> and what do we have here? Uh, when, uh, when Hugh Downs, who was the announcer for Jack Parr, sat in for Jack, I would sit in for Hugh. Right. Here's and... Dodie Goodman yep. and uh, Louis Nye. Believe it or not, from horror films, Peter Lorre over here. Now, what kind of a guest was he on a talk show, Peter Lorre? He, uh, he would have a few scotches in the... Uh, he was a good guest. Pretty good, then. Yeah, oh, well, he was And that's, that's you over here next to Dodie Goodman. On it. This was uh, when Jack walked, I believe, right? When She's wearing Jack a, a comeback Jack did the water, clock, yeah. uh, water closet uh, joke, right? Okay, and this... this Tic-tac-toe. Well, look at that elaborate set. Isn't that yeah, good? Uh, oh, that's beautiful. This was in the days of live television. This show came from across the hall, right over here in yes. uh, 6B. And one day, somebody walked behind this set and kicked all the electric cables out, which meant that we didn't have any scoring. And for eight minutes, I tap danced, told the story yeah. of my life, uh, did 17 commercials, and it was just horror. Yeah, you don't want a, a tic-tac-toe audience riot on your hands. No, that no, we had them. Ugly yeah. stuff. Now, here is, this is Bill Wendell, the leading man. Yeah. Good heavens. Gosh, I don't know what to say about that. It looks disgusting. <laughs> no, that's a fine photo, Bill. And what do you got here? First time that uh, Monty Hall came from Canada to do his first show, I did it with him, and there he is. Yep. What was uh, the name of the show? Uh, Stairway to the Stars, Stars, Stairway to the Stars, right. Here's Ernie and Edie and myself, and unnamed singer with guitar. That's at the close of the show. Do you know who that man is? No. All right, let's see, how much time do we have left? Oh, now here's Mr. Adventure again, I guess. No, these were, uh, I did a lot of cowboy stuff, and we would Just go around. Just around the house, Bill, or? Yeah. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty t tough following that horse around, but... <laughs> <laughs> Joey Adams, I'd do anything for Joey, so I'm lighting a cigarette here. Uh huh. Even tux. And, oh, here uh, we go. Here's, well, in this business, you know, Dave, once in a while you're out of work, so here I hired myself out as a butler to a very nice couple. Uh huh. Uh, Nipsey Russell and Leslie Uggins. What show was that? Alan King. The Alan King show. All right. Oh, and let's go out on this one. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. The My Fair Lady. Yes, sir. Bill Wendell, Mr. Adventure. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Dave. We'll be right back with Arsenio Hall. Arsenio Hall. I like that. I like that. I like that. I love his voice. And I'm going to play a clip now from August 18th, 1995, from the CBS Late Show with David Letterman. This was Bill Wendell's last night as an announcer. I just, I think this is historically significant, even if it's not laugh out loud funny. Let me play this for you now. Pop culture history. Yeah, I'm the nostalgia. Pop. Nice to see you. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome back to the big program. Bill Cosby is on the show tonight. Uh oh. And director Clive Barker. Hide the women. And uh, Leroy Purnell. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, is the uh, last night for our dear friend and beloved announcer, Bill Wendell. Bill has been with us, I think, since the morning show, Paul, before you were born. Before well. I was born. You, now, Paul, you weren't on the morning no, show. No, I was not. Now, why is that? I, I didn't get the call, <laughs> but I was there. As soon as you hit late night, I was there. I, I think you had a problem getting up in time well, for the morning show. Well, sometimes people have problems. Uh, anyway, Bill Wendell, who has been with us and has been the voice of this program uh, pretty much every single night, every single broadcast we did uh, on the morning show and also on the shows at the NBC and uh, now each of the shows here at CBS. Bill is leaving. This is his last night. Bill, I just want to take a second here to thank you for everything, for all your fine work, for, for the wonderful participation in the show. All your friendship. Good luck to you. God bless you, sir. Thank you for everything. Bill Wendell. And if I, and if, I can, if I can say something here, too, seriously, not a minute too soon, we're all getting tired of the ascot. Uh. <laughs> oh, let's
let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, here in my left hand, I have a copy of tonight's top ten list. Let's go. Let's... Wendell been wearing a scarf. I don't remember. Accessorize. I guess that, that's the key for the 90s, isn't it? Accessorize. Absolutely. Wearing a scarf. Oh, no. <laughs> God bless you, Paul. Nice going. Yeah. Here, let, let's see you do a little experiment. You hold that camera still, Dave. Here, now, ladies and gentlemen, if you ever see something like this, you know what this is? This, you know what this means? Bad camera work. <laughs> I just do the show like this tonight, shall we? Uh, <laughs> Here in my right hand, I have a copy of tonight's top ten list. <laughs> Dumb guys all over the country. Yeah, yeah, did you see Letterman last night? Or something? Hell, that a whack with the Sony or something? I don't know. <laughs> Add to some bitch on its side, nothing happened. They just pretty damn near slid off the screen. <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you're planning a big weekend, I'm planning a big weekend. <laughs> I got that new uh, John Deere 40 horse riding mower. Oh, boy. Uh, and, uh, is, it, is it starting to be a problem yet? No, is it's it... fine. Like <laughs> it, it's like the high school broadcasting club has taken over the show. Yeah. All right, you kids, come on in. You can yeah. run the equipment. Well, give me a chance one day. Just... Yeah, hey, go nuts, do whatever the hell you want, see if you can't. I kind of like that. Boy, oh boy. Man, I could just phone this in like I'm not doing that already. Uh, uh, the top ten list, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the category from the home office in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Something has gone desperately wrong here! One day all television will be like this. You know, we could do two or three shows simultaneously here like that. That's right. We got, we got plenty of space now. see that. Yes, yeah, sir. What? I'd like to see the boys down in Philadelphia at Westinghouse looking in on this one tonight. I don't know. They're wasting a lot of screen, if you ask me. Hey, Letterman's goofy or something. He could use a whole damn screen. No, he sits in the corner and hides like a little monkey. Hiding like a little monkey on his own damn show. How does that go, Paul? Hiding like a little, well, like a little monkey, monkey on his own damn show. show. Hey, 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 like a monkey. use up more to screen. Yeah, the audience... That wasn't a lull, oh, necessarily. I'm sorry. I've got All right, confused. please, please, come to the meeting and start wearing a scarf now that Bill's gone. <laughs> I don't know. I just looked over there, saw him in a scarf. I thought, that's odd. The guy's wearing a scarf. But it looked good, didn't it? It did look good. Yeah, that's sure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, category tonight from the home office in Grand Rapids, Michigan, top ten things Lisa Marie will miss about being married to Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. <laughs> See, because... When you sit at home, you really have no idea what's over here. You just have no idea. It could just That's be right. anything. You have no clue as to what's over there. What is over there? Well, you, what do you mean? You're like 20 feet. You well, I can me. see. Oh, brother. Man, my <laughs> what, what kind of scores you get on the SAT, Paul? <laughs> do they have those in Canada? I took the LSATs, actually. I did great. I don't know what that is. That's for law school, pre-law school. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Or talk show, pre-talk yeah. show. We're going to test you yeah. to get on the show, didn't we? Great, yeah, huh? Huh? okay. What? There's no top ten list? What a tease. This is a rehearsal. This is just a rehearsal. I'm going to stop and try this at a decent hour tomorrow. I'm sorry for the lateness of the hour. We've run out of time, but your film... Unreal. I should have screened that clip. But Bill Wendell, God bless him, he served this country in World War II in the United States Army Corps. And he was born in New York City back on March 22nd, 1924, and he passed away, sadly, at the age of 75 on Wednesday, April 14th, 1999. Now, moving on with the David, let's get to some laughs. Um, mm, I thought that top 10 list was intact, so I really need to start going to rehearsals. Uh, Studio 6A, which is where Late Night with David Ledman was taped before a live audience until he left in 1993 to go to CBS at the Ed Sullivan Theater. He was in Studio 6A, which later became home to Late Night with Conan O'Brien from 1993 until he left the show to host The Tonight Show. Um, 
David Letterman left the network and late night with Seth Myers, who in my opinion, well, I'm one to talk, right? I was about to say Seth Myers is both dumb and dull, but look at me, uh, <laughs> Mr. Talentless Chance Bartels, who is a nothing and a nobody. Anyway, um, Dave returned to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the debut of Late Night with Dave Letterman on February 1st, 1982, and he was on Late Night with Seth Meyers. He wasn't in the same studio, though. Um, Seth Meyers' show was taped in Studio 8G, but he was in the same building that he worked at all of those years for NBC. Now, let's see. Here he is. This is from the other night. This is from February 1st, actually the morning of February 2nd, 2022, on Seth Meyers' show, talking about his first late night first his first tonight. show which was a morning show it wasn't a late night show at all it was a morning show that i talked about earlier in the program this program which premiered 40 years ago tonight please welcome back to his show the one the only david letterman and as you as you most of you know he has this wild beard these days let's listen it looks like santa claus a thin santa claus and he still has his hair dave letterman Here's Dave. He's modest. And you know, Dave, I want to I want to interject something here as he walks to uh, be seated. He has never been a fan of interviews. Um, I've read many interviews he did. He was in a Playboy interview back in 84 that I read. He uh, was interviewed by Barbara Walters back in 92. And he's a very private man, according to accounts that I've read. I've never met him. I never sat in at a taping. I wish I had before he retired, but it just never happened for whatever reason, even though I've been to New York City. But let's listen to Dave talking about his first NBC show, which got canceled. And it lasted longer than Dave says here in the interview. Let's listen. You take these, All right, you so he, he pulls out it. like a, and, and you not a noisemaker, but a, 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 and we're gonna turn it a popper be another trip with no, confetti. No, 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 no. I already watched it. it, was just, hey, it was this is our celebratory. Just ready to Pretty visual, it. so I oh will. God, harder than I thought. We gotta get Jenny out here. So I love that. I'm going to stop the clip. Um, and thank you for the use of that clip unofficially, uh, Xfinity. Now, what happens is after I'm live, sometimes the bots, the soulless robots or bots, if you will, will mute part of the show. So I'm curious to see if when this is no longer live, if that entire interview is muted. And I'm just sitting here making stupid faces before the camera. And people don't know what the hell's going on. But generally, if you go to the YouTube channel or if you uh, listen on many, many of the po any and all of the podcast p platforms that I'm on, you'll hear the full audio. But what was missing from that interview, as I just said a moment ago, five minutes ago, was the great music by Paul Schaefer. And it must be a music rights issue. But let's fix that right now and listen to a little bit of the classic. I love the organ in this version of the theme. This will probably get muted down the line, but let's listen. I love that organ.
think that's David Sanborn on the sax saxophone, but better talk over this just in case. Paul Schaefer and the world's most dangerous band consisted of Sid McGinnis on guitar, Will Lee on bass guitar, Anton Fig on the drums. Going to play another version of the Late Night Theme in a moment from 1988. In which Paul Schaefer was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, but Johnny had a guest host that night. Back in 88, now not in 92, after Johnny retired in 88, and it was Jay Leno hosting. Before it was announced that Jay Leno would take over, which allegedly hurt and maybe a little bit angered David Letterman. The other thing I want to say is I remember when I was in college in the early 90s, and A&E would play reruns of Late Night with David Letterman on NBC and would have the logo of his production company, Worldwide Pants. And the story is NBC did that deal without Dave's knowledge, and allegedly Dave was really pissed off about it. I don't know if there's any validity to that report, but that's what I've always believed to be true, what I remember reading. But you never know what's real and what isn't real. Now, I, I was in fifth grade when the original Late Night with David Letterman started on February 1st, 1982. And what I would do after I discovered the show is I would record it on VHS and watch it after school instead of doing homework or studying. So I was part of the straight C student program that uh, Dave endorsed and created because he was supposedly a straight C student in Indianapolis. We'll talk about that in a second. And we're going to move on to another topic. I just want to quickly talk about, after I play another musical piece, my favorite moments of classic Late Night with David Letterman, and then we'll talk about something else. This isn't long. Got another couple minutes on this topic, and then we'll move along. I got a lot of fun stuff planned in this pod blast. Trust me. That's from the album, Paul Schaefer. So get that album if you can, or at least uh, look it up. So here is the 1988 performance. I just love this version of the theme, and then we'll move. We'll talk. We have Paul Schaefer and the Tonight Show Band. We you see this uh, group here. It kind of looks like one of those 60s softball games with the cops versus the hippies, you know? <laughs> but this is, uh, <laughs> this is Paul Schaefer uh, and the Tonight Show and, and, and his band from, the, from Late Night with David Letterman and the Tonight Show Orchestra doing the theme from Late Night. Please welcome, here they are, whatever they call themselves, they're unbelievable. This is the merging, east and west, here we go. Two, hour, two, three.
experimental. The melding, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Terrific. Well, that's, and that's one of the songs that is nominated for the Grammy, right? A Grammy nominated that's the pop Grammy. instrumental of the year, co-produced, if I may say, with Will. Sid and Anton. They the do a great job. And how about another nice hand for Doc as well yeah. in the band? Huh? Just great. Doc Severinsen. Right back after this message. Doc Severinsen. Oh, I'm about to be deaf. That was so loud in my ears, but a good loud. So Dave went to Ball State University and he graduated in 1969. And he began his career as a radio talk show host on WNTS, as in Sam AM. And on Indianapolis, Indianapolis's television station WLWI, which changed its call sign to WTHR in 1976. He was an anchorman and a weatherman. It's raining canned hams, ladies and gentlemen. It's <laughs> a terrible impression. I can't hear. I hear a terrible ringing in my ear. Anyway, I, this isn't the Biography Network, so that's all I'll say about Dave at this time. Um, and I just want to quickly talk about my favorite moments of watching as a fan of Late Night with David Letterman and The Late Show with David Letterman. I have a final clip of some comedy, which is good audio, funny as shit clip. But um, here's some of my favorite bits. Kmar, the discount magician, stupid pet tricks, of course, stupid human tricks, Jack Hanna, the animal expert from the Columbus Zoo in Ohio, Mr. Wizard. Remember Mr. Wizard? He would do scientific experiments. Don Herbert. He was awesome. Uh, he sadly passed away in 2007, June 12th, 2007. But I love it when Mr. Wizard, he was in the very first episode from February 1st, 1982, I, I might add. I loved Viewer Mail, which originally was on Thursday night and then Friday nights. I loved uh, Terry Garr in the time when she took a shower in one of the offices at Rockefeller Center in the NBC days. It was all on camera. Of course, you didn't see any nudity, but it was it was comical. It was funny. Dave got her to take a shower. Anyway, I love Dave dropping objects from a building like television sets and bowling balls. I loved his man on the street stuff on location, such as Dave visiting the new NBC owners at their headquarters at the GE building after they bought the network from RCA. I love the Velcro suit where he jumped up off of a trampoline onto a wall, a Velcro wall wearing a Velcro suit. I love the Alka-Seltzer suit in which he actually passed out allegedly supposedly and i believe it they had to have an oxygen mask after that because it the alka seltzers in that quantity supposedly ate up the oxygen so um i love the alka seltzer suit i love the rice crispy cereal suit where dave wore bags of rice krispies and he was in a huge cereal glass bowl and then a a massive barrel of milk was dumped on him. My notes say mile. That's supposed to be milk. I wrote this by hand, and I obviously screwed up. Anyway, a huge barrel of milk was dumped on Dave while he sat in a giant glass bowl of cereal, uh, and, and the mics picked up all the snap, crackling, and popping of the cereal. Uh, I love seeing uh, comedians make their debut, like Carol Leifer, Elaine Boozler. I love seeing Robin Williams doing stand-up and this hysterical guy jeff altman who played huey hogg in the dukes of hazard he was really hyper he'd always pull his pants up like his dad's pants he'd always do an impression of his father and he'd pull his pants up like over his belly button put his hands in his pockets like he's jiggling change and he was just a very very funny hyper comedian full of energy like robin williams i loved the moment where Cher called dave an asshole <laughs> well we've been trying to get you on the show for a while well how come how come you never uh agreed to come on before um, I heard you were an asshole. Beep. I heard you were a beep and a beep hole. Anyway, there was a funny moment with Oprah in 1987 with Dave when Dave took the show on the road to Las Vegas and she vowed never to do the show again after that interview, supposedly. Uh, so I loved it when he went on the road to Vegas or Los Angeles. Uh, I loved it when Johnny Carson was on Dave's show and he brought a desk with him. Johnny Carson did. <clears throat> funny bit. And I love to play a clip of this. This will be the final thing about Dave. Dave working the McDonald's and the Taco Bell drive through windows. Um, I love a bit where he <laughs> did some ice skating with Paul Schaefer, in which they used obvious stunt doubles, stunt skaters. Uh, uh, there was a moment in the summer of 86 where Dave um, called a restaurant down below near the old uh, ice skating rink and had this waiter actually weighed himself, weighed in a, uh, a water fountain. 
at the base of a water fountain. Basically, he took a bath while he's fully clothed as he's waiting tables. That was in the summer of 86. Uh, and Dave would always say to the guests in the summertime, how's your summer going? He always would ask that question. How's your summer going? He'd ask his guests. And I love this time back in 87 or was it 88 where Madonna and Sandra Bernhard from uh, King of Comedy. Remember see King of Comedy with uh, Robert De Niro? Kind of like, uh, and uh, oh, Jerry Lewis. Anyway, uh, Sandra Bernhardt was in that movie, but Madonna and Sandra Bernhardt were flirting with Dave hardcore in a particular memorable episode. And who could forget the guy under the seats, Chris Elliott. Chris Elliott, um, whose dad was in Bob and Ray, the old-time radio comedy team. But Chris Elliott, long before Get a Life, the sitcom he did. By the way, Get a Life, I still need to find out who wrote that line. They'd originated in November 1986 when William Shatner was hosting Saturday Night Live to promote the movie Star Trek IV. And they did a spoof of a Star Trek convention. And Shatner is getting irritated with all the inane questions from Trekkies or Trekkers. I'm a Trekker, but Trekkies. And finally, he and he just lets lets out his frustration and says, Get alive, would you? And they're like, what was, the name? what was the combination of your safe in the Starship Enterprise? He's like, oh, God, it was a TV show. I don't know, man. Get a life, will you? And I wonder if Conan O'Brien wrote that because he was one of the writers on SNL back in 86. But I digress. Chris Elliott, man, I loved The Fugitive Guy. They did a parody of the old Fugitive show starring David Jansen. Um, man, just Chris Elliott was just hysterical. Um, and I remember the Writers Guild Strike of America of 1988 and that was great because nbc aired best of reruns for months in the summertime and i loved it i could see episodes earlier episodes of late night with david ledman from like 1982 up until say 87 that i'd never seen and i recorded them all on vhs tape during that strike um Okay, now here's a final clip, and I promise we're going to move on. I've been saying that for 30 minutes, that uh, I'm going to wrap up the topic of mogul David Letterman. Here's the last clip I'm going to play. This is Dave working the McDonald's drive-thru, and this is from the official YouTube channel Letterman, which launched February 1st, 2022. I highly recommend it. If you want to see clips, it'll bring back a lot of memories. It's really, really funny stuff. going to play this, and hopefully... I won't have a problem or get muted. Listen. Yes, welcome to McDonald's. Uh, what do you want? Hello. What, yeah, what can I do for you? Medium Sprite. Relax, take a, take a couple of deep breaths, and let's try it again. Let me have that order again, please. Sprite. Medium Sprite. That's it. That's all? Yes. You couldn't have gotten out of your car for a medium Sprite? No. Hi, how are you? Oh, I love those earrings. Thank you. Look You're it. the guy that's giving me a hard time about the Sprite? No, no. Hello? Yes, uh, give me, uh, two number threes. Two number threes? And, uh, that should be it, then. You know, instead of two number threes, I'm just gonna give you a number six. Is that all right? That's fine. All right, come on through it, and you better have a smile on your face. No trouble, all right? Hello? Hi, can I have, uh, two cheeseburgers and a small order of fries? You know, ma'am, we're really busy. Can I ask you to circle the lot one time? Can you just go around, like, once or twice so we kind of uh, collect ourselves here? If you don't mind, it would really help us out a lot. We're just up to our necks here. Who is this? None of your business. Just circle the lot and we'll pick you up the next time, all right? Just circle the lot. Prove to me that you're happy. You're not. You're not getting anything, all right? Uh, the happy meal is uh, veal shank and and a German potato salad and uh, a side of lime jello. I'll have a small fry, quarter pounder with cheese. Okay, we're we're completely out of hamburgers. I'm sorry. Ma'am. Yeah. We're we're just out of the burgers today. Are you for real? Yeah, I, I forgot to get to the market. We ran out around 9, and I've just been strapped here, so I can't I can't get away. Just, can you go by and get us some ground beef? Hello, ma'am? Are you still there? I, I think we lost her. Yes, welcome to McDonald's. 
Yeah, let me get a cheeseburger. Are you ordered a cheeseburger? Yep. Are you busy right now? Uh, I gotta hit the work. Why? Wait, could you could you swing by the grocery store and get us a bag of onions? A bag of onions? Yeah, we're running low. Hello? Yeah, what is that two cheeseburgers meals? What do you get with that? Two, cheeseburger, two, che two cheeseburger meals? No. What do you get with those? Yeah. You, you get a, a free pack of cigarettes. Good, good. The, the regular kid uh, had to take a day off. He swallowed a straw. And they got yeah, he swallowed a straw. So they gave him a sick day. Hello? Yeah. We get a uh, number three. A number three? Yeah. What else? Uh. You sound, you sound like you're having trouble making up your mind. Are you all right? I'm all right. Everything all right at home? Everything all right with your family? Yeah. Yeah. Everything all right at work? Yeah, I think all right at work. Yeah, you sound just, you know, like a little depressed or something. <laughs> yep. How old are you, sir? <laughs> 30. 30? Yeah. Uh, and you're pretty much happy with where you are in life? <laughs> it's a number three, all right? All right, we'll get to the number three, but I'm, you know, I'm more concerned about you. Do you have a clergyman you could talk to? Uh, is it ready? Is it going to be ready or what? Yeah, the food's ready. Sure, the food will always be ready. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Come on in. This is a United 1697727. This is Kennedy Ground Control. What's the problem? <laughs> no, we had you in the air. We had you at about 1600. Just power it on in. Got your uh, onions in. What? A 10-pound bag of onions. Oh, you got the onions? All right, come on by. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks for hacking out. The channel was just 80 billion last year, and you guys running errands for us. Yeah, I want um, 10 of the 59-cent burgers. We, uh, sir, we have a 58-cent burger. We don't. We're out of the 59-cent burgers. Four uh, cokes, also, please. Four cokes. Excuse me, three Cokes and a Sprite. I'm sorry, you said four. You're getting four. I'm up to my neck here in order. You said four, and that's what we're going to do. I, there's three Cokes and a Sprite. You know, if that was first time out, sure, but... You know, you can't be changing it. The deal at CBS went away. No, that, that thing fell through. That's why I'm working here. Yeah, can I get two Whoppers, please? We're all out of Whoppers. Whoppers, Whoppers. We got no Whoppers. Great, you kids quit screwing around. We got no Whoppers here. Don't make me come out there. I'm trying to get on my nerves, these people. Do they ever get on your nerves? Can, we get, can I get a Sunday with nothing on it, just uh, ice cream? Yeah, you get an iced tea. No, ice cream. Oh, uh, ice cream, too. We got ice cream, too. Yeah, give me the ice cream without the cone. Just put it in the cup. You want cheese on that? On what? On, on the ice cream cone? Yeah, cheese on it? No, I'm not going to. Well, let me see that. Is that the club? No, I don't know. Let me see that. Look at this. Does it really work? Yeah, really well. Wow, look at that. It's a club. I've never seen one of these. One Diet Coke. Maybe. The club. An anti-theft device. That's it. Stick. Huh? No. How about some macaroni salad? No, thank you. Hey, how about some potato salad? How about a small garden salad? Hello? No, thank you. No salad at all? No. Hello? No, no salad. When was the last time you had a salad? <laughs> I'm in a rush to get back to work. Is it all right if we touch your food before we give it to you? How much do you weigh? How much do you weigh? Hello? <laughs> it just peels off you. Classic bit. I just love that. And see, it's still pretty decent audio, but if you want to see the video, go to Letterman, the official YouTube channel. Final thing, Dave became a TV mogul himself with the formation of his production company I talked about earlier called Worldwide Pants, which brought Tom Snyder back for The Late Late Show on CBS, which aired after Dave's Late Show with David Letterman. And also he produced sitcoms like the long-running Everyone Loves Raymond, starring Ray Romano on CBS, which aired from 1996 to 2005, 
and the 2000 to 2004 NBC dramedy Ed. And also they produced the HBO Foo Fighters documentary titled Sonic Highways. they are all made by Dave's production company, Worldwide Pants, among other projects. So happy anniversary to David Letterman. And I love the bits he would do with the models. And there was a funny bit where he's drinking a bunch of Mountain Dew. Or he'd be in a movie theater with a big bucket of popcorn with all this disgusting uh, butter all over his face. And and I loved it when he would feign an injury, ah, 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 you know, and when he was with a guest and freak him out anyway. And they were always like gross out bits, too, like especially during viewer mail where it looked like he'd injured himself, blood going everywhere. Anyway, funny show. So happy anniversary. Now we're going to move on. Item. This is old news now. You know, we're deep into February 2022 as I'm live. But I must acknowledge that Howard Hessman passed away. Sadly, on Saturday, January 29th, 2022, weeks, just weeks before his 82nd birthday. Howard was born Tuesday, February 27th, 1940, in Lebanon, Oregon State. Hessman first appeared on TV in the Thursday, September 19th, 1968, season three premiere episode of Dragnet. And the episode he was in was titled Public Affairs, DR-07. But Howard is best known as Dr. Johnny Fever on WKRP in Cincinnati for four seasons between 1978 and 1982 as the lead and also as the lead role of the history teacher, Charlie Moore, on Head of the Class on ABC. A lot of people younger than me remember Howard from that. And, and I've heard people on air and uh, radio people say, well, hell, why is he so well remembered? I mean, WKRP was only on the air for four years, but Head of the Class was very popular and uh, also he appeared regularly on uh, other films and shows between the 1970s and the 2010s with other noteworthy roles including sam royer the husband of the lead character and romano in the last two seasons of the sitcom by norman lear one day at a time that i'm watching now on dvd for the first time i took a break i'm in the middle of season eight i stopped at the episode where um Mackenzie Phillips' character, Julie, is about to give birth in a two-part episode. I need to check to see if that was originally a one-hour episode that they cut into two halves for syndication. Anyway, I digress. Uh, and then also, back, talking about Howard Hessman here, let um, me get back on track. Um, he had a supporting role in the film Police Academy 2, their first assignment. So no clip, no clip. Um, but God bless Howard Hessman, a great character actor. And he was very believable and smooth in everything he did. You know, every performance. He had those eyes, those soulful eyes. Just an incredible actor. Item. It's time for my fake rant of the week. And this time I'm ranting about February. I hate the month of February. No, not because I'm a racist and it's Black History Month. I'm not a racist. Or because it's Valentine's Day month. No. It's because we all get screwed over by two to three days with our mortgage or rental payments. Think about it. In a non-leap year, we get shorted three days in the month of February. And we have to pay the same amount of money, but we get less days every single February. So let's do the math. I broke it down here. I did some, some calculations here. So let's just say... At the age of 18, you leave home. Of course, many people don't, especially these days, and I didn't, but let's just say you leave home. So between the ages of 18 and 65, that's what, 47 years, right? So let's multiply the three days that February is short in a 31-day month. That's three days, okay? That would be 141 days. So three days times 47 years. Three times 47 is 141. Well, a leap year is every four years, right? So let's take 12 days off of that total of 141. That brings us to 129 days. Now, there's 365 days in a year. So if you do the math and you do the division and you're talking 129 days, we're screwed by landlords and lenders, mortgage lenders, by over four months in a 47-year period. Now, I'm factoring in the fact that there's 
April, June, and September, November, which are 30-day months, and the uh, leap years I mentioned a moment ago. So, man, that's fuck. That's friggin' four months that we're getting screwed out of in, in, in a 47-year period. <laughs> so, I think there needs to be, what did I call it? I wrote it down. Free, no, February Fairness Act. I want the February Fairness Act. I want our congressperson to get on it. I hate February for that reason that we get screwed over 47 years of four months of mortgage payment and rent payment. What about all that? I need to do an adjustment. We need to have an adjusted February payment. I'm sick of it. That's my fake rant of the week. Item. I've talked about this before, but I need a tip. You ever lose a key on your laptop? Uh, the D, the letter D is in David Key, and in David Letterman came off my laptop because I, I hammer the keys. Like when I was at the office at Cumulus Media, people would joke, oh, Chance is here, because I, I I, I, the power in these hands is astounding, and I can't seem to type lightly. I've tried, I've tried, folks. But eventually the letter D came off of this laptop. So... In your MacBook or tablet, have you ever had a key come loose? Because um, I pound those keys like a beast. How can I repair this? Now, before I summon the Geek Squad, I thought I'd ask the audience. So comment away or send me a message um, or call in 770-438-1050 as I'm live and let me know. I, I don't want to just super glue it. I mean, the obvious answer is you can glue it, but I think I will... Uh, I would screw that up. So let's move on here. Let's see. We're going to skip Al's movie corner. It's the middle of the night as I'm live at 2.34 a.m. Al's long in bed. He's been seeing movies like a madman. That's all he does is see movies. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing. But I wanted to see what he's been up to. I know he's seen a lot of uh, current movies. And uh, he's, he's a pretty good little reviewer. Doesn't go into a whole lot of detail. But he'll tell you if he cared for it or not. Now, item. Disney update. The Walt Disney Company does not yet own the NFL, the NHL, Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible, or Hershey Chocolates. Not yet. Oh, got to get my clip machine. I have an update. It's time for the weekly update. Oh, my ears are ringing, man. That Letterman clip, I had it jamming, man. It was it was like really, in a good way, really, really cranked up loud, man. I'm like partially deaf, but let's do our, our, our weekly update. This is Jeopardy! So there's no Jeopardy update this week. Not not a one because ever since Amy Schneider was defeated there's not really been a long-standing champion. It's just back to regular, kind of dull gameplay. But Mayim is back as host, and there's going to be a college tournament in prime time on ABC, owned by Disney, in February 2022, prime time. Check your local listings. I think it's at 8 o'clock. It's an hour program, and it's going to be on Tuesday through Friday. So check it out. And Mayim's doing a fine job as host. So that's your Jeopardy update for the week. There's a it's a update but a non update. And let's Oh gotta get serious here. Oh gosh, I gotta hum. I gotta have that fixed. There we go. A while ago I asked you to vote for the nostalgic pod blast online in a list of the top 50 radio shows and podcasts on a particular podcast website i won't mention well i want to apologize and uh, and tell you to stop voting i stopped voting you're allowed to vote for yourself and i would vote every, i stopped voting for myself a couple months ago but here's why um it turns out i mean this list is just a basically it's a circle jerk that, that, and no one can see the list except someone who 
buys service on the app. And so the, the owner of this company is smart as hell, okay? And, and they're making money off of the information and the email address of people who vote. Because when you vote, you have to submit an email address. So I want to apologize and thank everyone who voted, but it really is a circle jerk that no one sees except people that have the app or that on there. You can't see the list. Sometimes you can months after the fact, but just stop voting. It's a waste of time and it's pointless. Had I known it's a spam scam, I'd never asked you to vote. Um, like I said, the owner takes the email address of the voter, makes money off it. So don't do it. I abhor spam email. Abhor. A-B-H-O-R. Abhor. And it's a word. Look it up. If you don't know what it means, it means I dislike spam email with a passion. And I would not want you to suffer from it. I'm trained in digital marketing by Cumulus Media. and I, I, So I should have known better. Um, just don't do it. It's, it's just so stupid. It's so stupid and pointless. But I am grateful for those that voted, and uh, but don't do it anymore because it's not worth it. Um, question of the week. Yes, question of the week. What I do these days in the, in the nostalgic, with a C, Pod Blast Facebook group is I pose a question of the week, which I've known for the last three weeks now. And so the last question I asked of the audience was, did you ever have a magazine subscription when you were little that you look forward to receiving in the mail? I was always a big reader growing up. I need to read more these days as a, as a middle-aged adult. And I had quite a few responses. So, and also I said, hey, I'm going to mention your name on the air on the show. So I, I, I should have allowed more time. I think I allowed maybe 10 hours before I went on the air to ask, hey, can I say your name? And no one objected the last time I checked. So here we go. Here's some of the answers. Did you receive a magazine subscription when you are little that you look forward to receiving in the mail? What a novel thing in the age of the Internet print. I won't say it's dead. I won't say it's obsolete, but certainly it's not what it once was. So Wade Hackett said Boys Life magazine. Mike Maloney said The Weekly Reader. Uh, Bill Ottaviano said Highlights magazine. Erica Schmidt said Sports Illustrated. Good one. Jonathan Chase said he subscribed to World of Wings and Maxim magazine in his teen years. Oh, that reminds me. Golly. Is there a statute of limitations on this? But when, back in the 80s, when I was like 14 years old, a couple houses down from my parents' house, there was an airline pilot who lived in a really cool house, and he subscribed to Playboy magazine. Don't ask how I, I, I don't even remember how I figured that out. But I used to swipe the Playboy ad. That's mail. Hey, that's mail. What is it? Mail theft, I guess. Anyway, I, I can't believe I'm bending this on the air, but I used to do that. <laughs> Me and this neighbor friend of mine who sadly passed away last year, Larry Hutchison, we used to take Playboy from this. Because the pilot would never be home. And these, these days, with cameras being everywhere, you'd get nailed. And, and that's probably a very serious charge, by the way. So don't do it. Don't ever take mail. I never would. Not not anymore. Not as an adult. All right. So anyway, get back on track. So that's what Jonathan Chase said. Maxim. And I had a subscription to Maxim as well, but he's a bit younger than me, younger than I. And it was a gift. Um, David Kolf, spelled K-O-L-F, says he subscribed to the Electric Company magazine. See, now we're getting back to the innocence of this topic, of this question. Um, Christopher Vanderslice says Ranger Rick. I'm not familiar with Ranger Rick magazine. That's interesting. Uh, Trent Reeves said he subscribed to Owl Magazine, like the bird, the a wise owl. Never heard of Yes, I have. Actually, I have heard of that. I, I just wasn't thinking. David Metter said he subscribed to comic books. These titles in particular, these are all Marvel comic books. He subscribed to The Uncanny X-Men, Daredevil, Alpha Flight, The New Mutants, and The Fantastic Four. And I replied to his Facebook comment and remind him, that the comic books from Marvel would come in a brown wrapper. And sometimes the post postal person would fold the comic, causing a crease right down the middle, which affects, of course, the value. Who knew that comic books would be valuable? And they certainly, certainly are. Um, and let's see, I subscribe to Marvel Comics as well. I subscribe to The Amazing Spider-Man, The Fantastic Four, The Incredible Hulk, The Avengers, Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, and Marvel Tales. James Downing says he subscribed to these music magazines, Circus, Cream, Rolling Scene, Hit Parader, and Rolling Stone. I subscribed to, subscribed to Rolling Stone as well. I remember reading uh, 
Bonfire, The Vanities, um, like an abridged version that was published in Rolling Stone magazine. Heidi Taylor said she subscribed to Teen and YM. I think that stands for Young Miss magazine and Sassy magazine, which was her favorite. Uh, Chris Sek- Seckinger says he subscribed to Ranger Rick, National Geographic World, which I did too, thanks to my uh, grandma on my dad's side in Florida. Uh, Chris also subscribed to Highlights and Cricket when he was in, a, in elementary school. Scooter Parker said, I subscribed to many. I loved Cricket. Don Radford said, I subscribed to lots. Uh, Brad Wapert said, National Geographic and Mad Magazine. I replied to that. What about Crazy Magazine? That was Marvel's facsimile of Mad Magazine. Marvel Comics published Crazy Magazine. Um, I subscribed Chance Bartels to Pizzazz Magazine, which is only around for like a year and a half. It was Marvel put it out and um, it had a lot of games, original comic strip for Star Wars. I think it debuted in like January 77, which that's always three months ahead. So the end of 70, during, you know, right when Star Wars was released and after Star Wars was released, they had a Tarzan comic strip that they kept drawn by John Buscema, who's an awesome comic book artist. And as is his brother, Sal Buscema, but I digress. But Pizzazz had a lot of games, crossword puzzles, articles about music, movies, um, things that were, it was pretty much for young teenagers. Pizzazz magazine, but it didn't last long, like I said. Christopher Reeve was on the cover of the last issue. Uh, And they made a joke, because it was a Marvel publication, and Superman is a DC, their main competitor. (laughs) One of their characters uh, at DC. So after Pizzazz was canceled, I switched to Crazy Magazine, the Mad Magazine clone Marvel comic style. And I love National Geographic's world that my, my grandma on my dad's side gave me. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Had a flashback thanks to Brad reminding me of Fangoria magazine, which was a magazine by the company that published Starlog, which was like a geek. It was before the internet. It was like a movie magazine that catered to science fiction, television, and film. And so Fangoria was about gore. And I, I couldn't subscribe to that. My dad wouldn't allow it. It was a killer magazine because it showed a lot of the gore effects I mean, I wasn't allowed because I scared my little sister. I was a bad big brother in this regard. I would show her some of the gory photos in Fangoria, and she was like three and a half years younger than me and kind of freaked her out. But I had to buy copies of Fangoria at the mall at Walden Books or B. Dalton, and it was like gore porn. (laughs) It really was. It was just Fangoria. And I remember I got in trouble at uh, Dickerson Middle School showing those horrific images, and I would draw pictures like uh, pen and ink and and pencil, draw like horrifying images. And one of my teachers thought I was possessed because I created this character, the Angel Slayer. I mean, totally kidding. I wasn't demonic or satanic. God, no. I'm a God-fearing guy. But I remember this. My sixth-grade teacher, Mr. O'Leary, was really spooked by the Angel Slayer, and I, I can't say that I blame him. So continuing on with people answering the question, what magazines did you subscribe to that you look forward to getting in the mail? Matt uh, Kawaiki says Stereo Review. I was an audio snob at a young age, and I subscribed to Omni Magazine. That was published by Bob Guccione, who also published Penthouse Magazine. But Omni was a, a, uh, a good science fiction magazine, no nudity, nothing gross. It was just... A straight magazine. Sean Waldrop said he subscribed to National Geographic, Popular Mechanics, and Popular Science. Katherine Anderson says she subscribed to Bop and Sassy magazines. Sherry Dalton says she subscribed to Tiger Beat, Teen, and Seventeen magazines and Rolling Stone. That's where I read that Bonfire of the Vanities. I talked about a moment ago. Ooh, I'm starting to lose my voice. Let's see. Jamie Memes, M E. No. Jerry. Jamie. Merns, M-E-R-N-S, yes, I can read, said, no, I didn't subscribe. I just got them from the shop myself. My favorite was the Look In magazine. I think that's British. He might be in England. And Shoot and Match magazines. Okay, I think that those must be British publications. And it's funny how magazines in Britain, they're taller. They're bigger than magazines in the United States of America. Anyway. Uh, Ryan Settles, who's a friend of the Pod Blast, who has been a guest and a co-host in the past, he subscribed to Guitar World. He's a buddy of mine, going back to high school. Chuck Adams said he subscribed to Famous Monsters of Filmland, circa the 1960s, and those are worth some money. Those are worth a little bit of coin. Not quite as much as comic books, especially Marvel comic books in the Silver Age and Bronze Age, but they do have value. 
That's for sure. If you look on eBay, look up Monsters of Filmland. They go for some coin. So Todd Lower says he subscribed to Popular Science. Garrett Yeager said he subscribed to Ranger Rick. Ranger Rick again. Uh, Ilya Dinoff says he subscribed to Mad Magazine. One dollar. Cheap. Remember on the cover it would say cheap. Cheap. Whatever the price was. 75 cents. Cheap. I bought Mad every month. I don't know why I didn't subscribe. But I loved it. Uh, Chad says he subscribed to Boys Life and Highlights Magazine. Stacy Berkowitz says she subscribed to Highlights Magazine. Shane B., who called into the Pod Blast last time and reviewed some movies, talked about how his disdain for Matrix 4 and Scream, the new remake or reboot of Scream. He says he subscribed to Lowrider and Truckin' Magazines. And Sean Findlay says... He subscribed to Um Life, UM Life. I don't know what that is. Time, I know, of course, what Time Magazine is. Who doesn't? Person of the Year, formerly Man of the Year, and Sports Illustrated. Now, you remember, um, this is me, Chance, talking with you in the audience. Remember High Times Magazine? That was a niche magazine. National Lampoon, which sometimes would have boobs in it. Uh, and, of course, everyone knows the movies from National Lampoon, National Lampoon's Vacation, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what was the other one they did? Um, the Hollywood Nights. Wasn't that a National Lampoon R-rated comedy? Anyway, and I remember Esquire magazine. When I was in elementary school, one of my friend's dads had Esquire, and sometimes that would have some very minor nudity in it. Remember the biker magazines also? Yeah, anyway. So I love print. And uh, as you can see behind me, if you're watching the video of this live broadcast, you'll see some comic books. And that's part of my comic book collection. I have a bunch of magazines, too. Uh, I just love, I love print. Still do. Oh, my gosh. Now it's time for another. I should have had this clip ready, folks. I'm not prepared. It's time for another weekly segment. And I'm going to start winding things down. I don't want to have a six-hour marathon. No one's going to listen that long. And it's just insane to sit here by myself and talk that long. And, and no one's going to listen that long. So what, unless they stop and start it, uh, maybe on a treadmill or if they need help sleeping, this is better than melatonin, folks. Listen to this show. You'll have no trouble getting to sleep. I promise you of that. Let's see here. It is finally time. And this is a very brief version of this segment. Normally, this goes pretty long. It's time for birthdays. <laughs> Days. I'm just going to do a handful this time. Got to get caught up, but we're going to stick to February 2022. Let's do it, shall we? Okay, so got a very special birthday here, and I'm not going to play a clip because I, I just, like I said, I wanted to cut the show down. Oh, God, I've got to get rid of that hum. Back on February 2nd, it was the heavenly birthday to this angel who was born with his birth name, Farrah Lenny Fawcett on Sunday, February 2nd, 1947, in Corpus Christi, Texas. Of course, we're talking about Farrah Fawcett, who also was a guest on The Late Show with David Letterman. She had a rather infamous appearance, I won't play the clip of, where she seemed lost or dazed. Anyway, um, but did you know Farrah Fawcett was seen on TV early in her career as Major Roger Healy's girlfriend in the last season of I Dream of Jeannie in the 1969 to 1970 season on NBC. And then the season after the cancellation of I Dream of Jeannie, as everyone knows, the ratings tanked when Major Anthony Nelson and Jeannie finally tied the knot in that final fifth season. She was in the next season in the Partridge Family in the fall of 1970 before appearing in other shows such as The Six Million Dollar Man with her husband, Lee Major. She was in that show four times, and two of them she played the same character. She played an astronaut, Kelly. She was legally married to Lee Majors from 1973 until 1982. But Farrah finally found her soulmate with her lover, Ryan O'Neill. 
the couple produced Farrah Fawcett's only child, named Redman, in the year 1985. Now, long before the Rachel hairstyle that Jennifer Aniston started on Friends in the 1990s, you had a whole world full of women mimicking the classic feathered hair that Farrah Fawcett donned in Charlie's Angels in that one season she was a regular in 1976 to 1977. After that first season, it's well publicized. Um, a lot of people blame Lee Majors and say that Lee wanted Farrah home to cook him dinner. And that's been dispelled. It's a he said, she said situation with that. But even after 76, 77, under contract, they made a deal where Farrah would come back so many times per season to make a guest appearance as Jill Monroe, her character. And of course, who could forget Farrah Fawcett's famous full piece swimsuit wall poster of 1976, which sold over 12 million copies and set a sales record. And many mocked Farrah for what many perceived as a lack of talent in terms of her acting ability, but that all changed in 1984 when the TV movie The Burning Bed aired on NBC, which was about spousal physical abuse, which is very, very serious. Then came the theatrical film Extremities, which also gained Farrah Fawcett accolades for her performance as a rape victim who turns the table on her attacker. Farrah Fawcett sadly died at the age of 62 on Thursday, June 25th, 2009, the same day as Michael Jackson. Her death was sort of overshadowed and uh, upstaged by the death of the King of Pop. The Academy Award annual In Memoriam Retrospective se segment honoring those who passed away the prior year did not even recognize Farrah Fawcett, which angered many fans, including yours truly, Chance Bartels. Farrah Fawcett's film credits include Love is a Funny Thing in 1969, Logan's Run in 1976, Sunburn in 1979, which she had scenes opposite love interest played by Charles Grodin, and Art Carney's in that film as well. She was in Saturn 3 with Kirk Douglas, and she's seen Topless in that 1980 film. I sound like a creep pointing this out, like I did in the Lenny Larson show talking about the nude scenes Lindsay Wagner did in 19, shot in 71 years before The Bionic Woman. But I point this stuff out, you know. I point it, I try to help brothers out out there. I'm just kidding. Um, Mira Breckenridge in 1970. Um, she was in, of course, Cannonball Run. What a great movie with an ensemble cast. Burt Reynolds, Roger Moore, Dom DeLuise and the like. I could go on and on. She was in Cannonball Run in 1981. And the aforementioned Extremities in 1986. And Man of the House in 95 opposite Chevy Chase. I like that movie. That was a Disney movie. Uh, and Jonathan Taylor Thomas was in that movie, and he played Farrah's son, and they were going to be a, a potential blended family. And, of course, you know, uh, the kid played by Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who was on uh, Home Improvement with Tim Allen at the time, his character was having issues with Chevy Chase's character uh, being the new dad. Um, she also was in The Apostle in 1997. I think that's why she was on The Late Show with David Letterman in 97, and that appearance that was talked about and somewhat controversial, and she was in uh, Dr. T and the Women in 2000. So rest in peace, Farrah Fawcett. I'm not going to play a clip. Um, I, I'll, I'll play a clip on her birthday when, when that comes around, uh, which will be, of course, which just came and went. <laughs> I mean, the anniversary of her passing is what I mean, um, in June. In June, I will uh, do a full... And I already have talked about her more fully, and you can see better stuff visually um, on YouTube channels um, if you want to see something. But come June 25th, the week of June 25th, I will go into detail with some clips of Farrah Fawcett. So moving on, we're going to skip ahead to February 4th, a February 4th birthday list. Oh, let me get this for the camera. Happy 74th birthday to the great Alice Cooper. What a great musician he is, and just iconic, that look. I'm going to talk about that. Let me just, before the camera, put this comic book on the screen uh, that Marvel Comics released. Let me see how this is coming in here. It's kind of tough. Yeah, there it is. Okay. It's before the camera now. And 
Alice Cooper, his birth name is Vincent Damon Furnier. I'm probably mispronouncing that. It's spelled F-U-R-N-I-E-R. Is the R silent? Is it Furnier? I should know. But happy 74th birthday to Alice Cooper, who was born as Vincent Damon Furnier. Fournier. On Wednesday, February 4th, 1948, in Detroit, Michigan. Now, the origin of the stage look was revealed in his 2007 book and autobiography titled Alice Cooper, Golf Monster. When Alice Cooper stated that his movies, he stated that movies were his partial inspiration for that look. And one of the band's all-time favorite movies was the Betty Davis, Joan Crawford horror movie from 1962 titled Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Cooper wrote in his book, well, in the movie, Bet wears a disgusting, wears disgusting caked on makeup. Now, I'm sorry, let me back it up. I want to have the actual quote correct. Cooper wrote in his book, in the movie, Bet wears, Betty wears disgusting caked makeup smeared on her face and underneath her eyes with deep, dark black eyeliner, unquote. Another movie that the band watched over and over was Barbarella. And Alice Cooper said, When I saw Anita Pallenberg playing the great tyrant in that movie in 1968, wearing long black leather gloves with switchblades coming out of them, I thought, that's what Alice should look like. That and a little bit of Emma Peel from The Avengers. Now, The Avengers meeting a British series starring Patrick McNay. And Emma Peel was a sexy character and she replaced uh, honor blackman who went on to play pussy galore in goldfinger the third james bond film ever made um but emma peel replaced that character played by honor blackman in the avengers and of course oh, i'm gonna play a couple songs by alice cooper i love schools out that's like one of the essential songs to kick off the summer hiatus for students everywhere uh and i love i'm 18 the We've talked about that on the Pod Blast before with Danny Cochran. Uh, that's just a great song about the milestone of turning 18, the age of 18. Now let's listen to a little bit of Alice Cooper's music. Let's see, what did I do with you, my little friend? Here we go. Yeah, here's a here's a live performance from 1979 of Schools Out. This is courtesy of Shout Factory. This is courtesy of Shout Factory. Turn it up! Ultra latex. They are 
crowd took death from everyone. They blew my right ear out, and I can't care. And I'll get back at them someday. On piano and organ stuff. Pretty man now. Johnny Stiletto, Rick Astor, 
Good old fashioned jam right there. Wow. Thank you to Shout Factory Music and, of course, the great Alice Cooper. I'm going to play one other song, I'm 18 Live, also from 1979, courtesy of Shout Factory Music. This isn't as long, it's about four minutes. Alice Cooper in the band. Live in 
See, that's a bit different than the in-studio recorded version. 18? I don't know what I want. I love the performance, and it's awesome stuff visually. And, of course, the audio is just incredible. With those guitar solos. Man, what a band. Going to play a little quick clip of Alice Cooper talking with Johnny Carson. This is from June 14th, 1977. On the Tonight Show. Let's see. Here we go. Let's listen to a little bit of this. This interview here with the great Johnny Carson. Who was David Letterman's uh, mentor? Alice Cooper is starting his uh, nationwide tour on June 19th in Anaheim uh, Stadium. And any of you who have seen an Alice Cooper concert knows that it's, it's really an experience. It is some kind of happening. And he's had a lot of strange things on stage with him at one time or another. But it seems that he wanted a particular artist to join him on this tour. And last week, we picked up a copy of the Daily Variety, which is the trade, one of the trade papers here in Los Angeles. It says, open audition. Travel, excitement, meet new friends. Alice Cooper wants you. Alice Cooper is looking for a snake to perform in his act. No prior acting, singing, or dancing experience necessary. Any species of snake can apply regardless of sex, nationality, or religious persuasion. Employee benefits include a liberal pension arrangement, free hospitalization, <laughs> profit sharing, Christmas bonuses, and an occasional human sacrifice if you are the right reptile. Uh -oh. So forth, and it says uh, limited recitations to three minutes. Aspirants must bring resumes, glossies, and proof that he or she is not venomous. We insist on the latter. Well, I understand that Alice found his uh, winner at the snake auditions yesterday, and I believe that's it sitting in it's front in of the bag, right there. Would you welcome <laughs> Alice Cooper? Alex. <laughs> I cracked up when I saw the ad last week. That's yeah, a funny well, idea. You know, showbiz. Showbiz. Yeah. Did agents show up? Any of the snakes have agents? <laughs> they did. Well, it wouldn't yes, surprise me out here in this crazy. So in the bag you have, uh, how many snakes did you have to audition? Well, we went through about a hundred snakes. And, uh, yeah. you know, we have to do bathing suit okay, contests. Wait, I didn't know we had some pictures here. Oh, we do? Oh, yeah. Right. We had... This, this guy here was a big guy. Good yeah. heavens, that's a bow constrictor, isn't it? Yeah, that's an enormous one, though. That's, that's too big for me. Would this you believe here that was... that many people would show up, Alice? I mean, with the... Yeah. I yeah. guess in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't bother. Hollywood Boulevard, you know, there's enough snakes. <laughs> <laughs> These are crazy. That man. one there, that lady there... Yeah? ...is, uh... Ooh. Now, did most of them have these as pets? Uh... <laughs> yeah, they were mostly pets, well, but I, mean, I don't know what her here, problem was right there. That's a lot of snakes. That's ten. She had ten snakes on her. Goodness, this looks like another boa constrictor. Yeah, they mostly were. Pythons are a little bit more gamey, you know. I mean, they'll strike. Oh, I see. You didn't want a snake no, that would, that would well, attack I'm, you, of course. Right? I'm a little guy. Look at kids. Now, here's a kid. You know, most people don't like reptiles or have a fear of snakes, but kids generally don't have any fear whatsoever, right? Because that they have snake, a... that snake is bigger than that kid. Yeah. It really is. That was the one that was uh, probably the best snake in the whole show. You have to learn that fear, I guess, of yeah. uh, snakes. And no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the true story about, we'll talk about in a moment. But the, what they'll do is snakes are, are uh, they don't have any hearing. So they can't, like, hear anything loud. They have, like, an adrenaline thing. And uh, they smell adrenaline when you exude adrenaline in your body. That's why they pick the tongue all the time? Is yeah. That picking up? Yeah, and they pick up a fear smell. And so, like, I, I could pick up, you could pick up. Right. Well, you can. Well, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Tell well, us about the snake first, Alice. This is a wonderful little guy here. And, sure. Uh, this is the one that actually was the best snake. Remember Eve saying that to Adam? It was a wonderful <laughs> little guy. <laughs> My last snake was named Eva Marie Snake. Really? Eva, yeah. Marie, Marie, Eva Marie Snake? Yeah. This is a oh. good one right here. See, now most people think uh, you shouldn't go, oh, they think that snakes are slimy. They are not. No, they're not. They're very clean. I like snakes myself. I come from the Midwest, yeah, and they, don't, they bother don't, bother, don't bother me at all. This, this is a... Uh... I'm totally surprised he's doing this. <laughs> it's a harmless snake, isn't it? It is. Yes, sure. <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I, I should have asked that question prior to picking up this... This is, uh... this is one of the nicest, cleanest... I mean, look at this. It's, it's sparkly. No, there's no they're, not, they're not slimy. They're dry. They're clean. But, boy, can you feel the power. Yeah. He's wrapped yeah. himself around... Oh, but that's... <laughs> Around the side of <laughs> he's, he's hooked myself. On Don't let him get any place else down there. He's on the microphone. <laughs> he's on the mic. He hooked himself around All the right, microphone. All right, well, get him out of there. <laughs> he wants to guest host on Monday. Yes. 
Will you see that? Well, this one really is not that safe. <laughs> Yeah, Snake's he, no trooper. <laughs> He's hooked onto the microphone board and he won't let go. Yes. Okay, listen, let's talk to him. You, hey, big fella. Hey, baby, what's happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually is hooked onto the microphone. He has wrapped his body, his tail. I wish you could see this. Can you get a camera around here? Yeah, yeah he's <laughs> he's wrapped his tail. He's just nervous. That's the all. microphone there we cord. Go. There we go. Yeah, we're out now. No, wait, we're not out. You wouldn't <laughs> believe the strength of this yeah. uh, reptile. What kind of a snake is this? This is a boa. This is a boa? This is actually not a... <laughs> he actually did a take. He you're, like you're a, get snake, <laughs> a double snake take. Mm. <laughs> double tongue take. Well, no, he's, oh, he's all right. Really, he's this, this is going, this this going one, on tour with young one. Yeah, this is the one that's going to go on tour with us. Now, did you rent the snake? Or did you buy the snake? No, her name is Angel. Uh -huh. And uh, kind of visually, he's holding up really a snake. Amazing. So let me you know, put on another me, clip of Alice, and then we'll move guy. on past yeah, Alice Cooper. <laughs> you don't care for snakes, do you? I don't like snakes. You yeah. see, they're really, yeah, they're very, they're very, very clean. They're actually, they're actually much safer than uh, than a dog. Yeah, you know? snakes do not. This snake does not bite. I mean, it, would, it would only strike you if you, uh, you know, if it were 24 hours before or after feeding. When then it, it would. When did it eat last? <laughs> Excuse me. We this didn't one did eat about two weeks ago. Please. So I mean, they only. They only eat. Yeah. It's my. Uh, Let me take a. There you go. Yeah. Take a break. Now I'm going to play another. This is my final clip in this tribute to Alice Cooper on his birthday, which already came and went, but here he is in 1981 with Tom Snyder. And we talked about Tom Snyder. That was the uh, show, the Tomorrow Show, that David Letterman replaced on February 1st, 1982. But then Dave brought him back on CBS. But let's listen to, hopefully this is in stereo, not mono, but this is... Uh, back now with Alice Cooper and reading about the things that I said you have done on stage in your lifetime. Those sound bizarre to old Tom. You know, Tom sits here with a glass of water and talks to people, and that's kind of the I've act. I've some bizarre shows on this. What, what <laughs> the Sterling Hayden show was bizarre. You thought bizarre? Yes, I thought so. Oh, bizarre of the mind, yes. though, not bizarre of the physicality. What is the strangest or weirdest illusion or effect uh, that you've ever done on stage? Well, uh, that's hard to say because a lot of things are, are imagined by the audience. Um, it's like a surrealist, a surrealistic kind of approach. Well, did, uh, there was a story, remember, when you killed the chicken, but you really didn't kill the chicken. Well, you know, there's 90% of, of my whole thing is, is, is you know, the legend is uh, rumors. I just decided not to deny any of them, you know, because some of them are very creative. <laughs> And yeah, but tell me you didn't kill the chicken. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Sanders kills chickens. I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, no, I it was. Um, I don't really remember. Alice might have done that, but you know, I, I don't think I did. <laughs> the thing, the thing about that is, what, what is Alice somebody else? Oh yeah, well Alice, you know, is, is the, the character that performs really, you know, and. Um, and then who are you? Oh, I'm just you know. Ozzy Nelson, you know, <laughs> I, just, I just sit around being very, very normal, you know, uh -huh. but then that, that promotes the, the character, that promotes the character, the more normal I get in my regular life, the more bizarre Alice gets, and so like they feed off each other. Now what about the time Alice had his head chopped off? Oh yeah, that was fun. I think we have My some, mom hated that one. I think we have some videotape and maybe we can roll that and uh, you, people can watch it and uh, I don't know or if listen to it. the illusion here as to what happened. No, or... I, I died every night. It was... Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, here it goes. You gotta be kidding. You this gotta be real. kidding. Hi, Alice. <laughs> they love me, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> My kids. <laughs> all, the, all the parents are like, yeah! <laughs> I mean, you got to kind of feel for a second like if they're cheering the blade coming I down, know, what do they think of me for it? Well, well, the thing is, is like, Alice is like a catharsis up there, you know? He's like, uh, there's, we have very few fights in our audience. You know, because it's like after you saw Clockwork Orange, nobody wanted to go out and fight after that because they did it for you on the, on the, on the film. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we, we use violence because it's sensationalism, and I love sensationalism. You know, I think that that's, that's the whole basis of my show. I would much rather pick up uh, a, mag a magazine, I won't name with magazine, this is Boy Born with Dog's Head, rather than, you know, Reagan does a da 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 you know, because that's more <laughs> sensational, you know. Uh, more people would go to an airplane wreck than a circus. 
just because that's the way that, that uh, human nature is, you know. And so, like, what I do is I just give them images. I throw images. There's a snake out. So if I throw the snake out there and bring yeah, it out no, there, the you will, you'll take it sexually, maybe. She'll take it funny. She'll take it serious. So that's one. If I throw a crutch out there, they'll t by the end of the show, you have 20 different images. You'll walk away with a whole different story than she will. Mm -hmm. So I'm making you use your imagination. Uh, they told me backstage, the p producers, that you wanted to come out here with a snake tonight. Yes, I did. I, I, I move. I get a little... She <laughs> 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 I get a little uneasy around snakes, which is stupid, I know. It's no, a they're, dumb they're, thing to they're do. really nice. If you, you know, you feed them. We feed this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like you know, people, two or three yeah. groupies a week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one, this one is really, I mean, she's no stage. A Angel, her name is Angel. You know, she, she lives in Beverly Hills now, you know. And uh, she won't eat rats. She's mink. You know, she's, I don't know, rats. What's rats? And she knows, she actually knows when she's on stage. So you bring her out there and her ego comes out. And so, uh, you know, do you snake. think all the people that go to watch you perform uh, in the spectacular stage shows that you do have the foggiest notion that you, Alice Cooper, live in a house in Beverly Hills, California, next door to Barry Goldwater Jr. and are a very quiet, meek, mild-mannered singer with a major metropolitan newspaper? I'm, I'm a model citizen. <laughs> no, they, they, the thing is, is again, I love the idea of playing the two images against each other because people still don't have any idea. You know, why did I go on Hollywood Squares? You know, I mean, well, why did you? Well, think of it. Because the, the same lady that's winning a car won't let her kids go to my show. You know, and I thought that was a really bizarre sort of, uh, you know, just putting me into that, to that thing, plugging me in was a really pop art kind of statement, you know. Uh, you know you're a legend when you're a question on Gambit, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you sit there, I'm sitting there in the morning watching, I like I love quiz shows, and, you know, because I know I'm smarter than those people. And I sit there and I watch, and I'm watching them, and they said, who is Vincent Fernier? You know, who is Alice, Alice Cooper. Cooper? Right. You know, whatever. Happened? The lady knows, but she's forced, whatever you know. happened to that's how you pronounce his last name. Back there on the trail. What, what happened to him? Oh, he's still around. Yeah. You know? He was pretty. He was fun and everything like that. The R is silent. I, I'm still Vince. A lot of times, Vince. I look like Vince to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Vince. No, I was always. A, but Alice, the character Alice, was needed. He's a real need because the stage needs to be used, and it, it needs to be. Uh, uh, take, you know, they say called it gimmicks. That was a bad word. They used to say, oh, Alice is gimmicks mm -hmm. and that. Well, sure, what's wrong with gimmicks? As long as the music backs it up. If it were just gimmicks with no music, then it would just be, a, you know, a farce. You know, anybody can go out and buy, buy props, a 13-foot cyclops. But if you haven't got the music to back it, why it's there? Right. You know, then, then it's, you know. There's a quote attributed to Frank Zappa way back there on the trail somewhere. I love Frank Zappa. a small place in Los Angeles Don't early on in his career. Every place in Los Angeles. <laughs> Uh, where apparently the customers left. Oh, yeah. And Zappa said any band that can empty out a club that fast <laughs> yeah. must have something going for it. Even the hippies what, hated it. Yeah, was, was that a true quote, though? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, that was a true fact. It was a hip thing to do, like, in about 1969, to walk out on Alice Cooper. You know, we used to play the Cheetah Club, if you remember the Cheetah out on mm -hmm. Navy Street. Mm -hmm. Big place, called 6,000 people. And we'd go on, in two minutes, they'd be gone. <laughs> you know, there'd be three people out there. We'd say, wow, new record tonight. But the thing was, is the fact that it was like 1968, remember, and people were still doing this. And, and they were still, oh, gee, everything's wonderful. And we weren't like, you know, that's the last thing we stood for. We stood for, you know, fun. And so we'd go out there, and I said, what does it matter? We haven't got anything to lose. Go out there with Alice Cooper, of course. You know, they're going to expect a blonde folk singer. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and they got, you know, they got it, which was totally. And we, like I said, even the hippies hated us. We had no friends at all. And that was, that was the, if you can take that much energy, and it was a good show, it was, it was so powerful that they hated to see, think that that was the future, you know. And we liked it. We said, listen, it's just fun, you know. But then how did you turn it around? Did you, did, did, did you tailor it more to them, or did they come around to you and realize that uh, while there were a lot of, quote, gimmicks, end of quote, going on, there was some solid music backing up that, that, well, uh, even, that, even that at, yeah, well, even at the show. time, at the time, you know, we didn't even have enough money to buy gimmicks, so we, anything we could find backstage was was part of the show. <laughs> you know, find a mop. Oh, that'll work. Right. You know? Hey, get a chicken. Get a chicken. Yeah, anything right. that they would throw on stage, really, was was a was a, a gimmick, because nobody did anything at that period. Everybody played a guitar solo for 14 hours, you know, and, oh, that's great. You know, that's wonderful. But this thing showed them. It was, it was a flash. It was an, uh, and it was an American sort of vehicle. We were talking about the 22 TVs. I pick up almost all my... my let, me, let me tell you something, Alice. i got to do these commercials. Now, listen here, Alice. We will, uh, we will continue with Alice Cooper uh, with more conversation and more music right after these announcements.
ever wanted to get up on stage and sing a quiet song to match your quiet life? Oh, I do ballads. Sure, I do. There's one song called Dead Babies that we did. It was a... I don't mean... I, <laughs> it was a Whoa. sweet song. I don't I mean was... that Whoa. one. I was thinking more like... Uh, I like Burt Bacharach. I think Burt Bacharach. Yeah, yeah, elevator music, as they yeah, call I, it. I, I, like, I like, you know, sing... Any, anybody that puts time into anything. Like, I can't stand it when they knock movies. They killed the choir boys. You know, every... I like that movie. And I, I thought um, Myra Breckenridge was good, too. You know? Because, you know... I mean, there was something good about it. Now, why do they murder movies like that that... You know, and same with, same with music, you know? Uh, it's just the fact that anybody that puts time into anything, I, I appreciate, you know? Even if it's awful. We were just talking about Green Acres was a great show. <laughs> Honestly, you know, if you thought about it in the right, Gilligan's Island was a great show. Oh, come on. Well, the, I mean, he just a theme song, you know. <laughs> pretty bizarre. <laughs> Frank Duvall or whatever it was. And now here with the theme song from Gilligan's <laughs> Island. No. If I want to hear it to my wife, you know, I just sing, uh, da 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 Green Acres. Stop it, I'll do anything. <laughs> 22 television sets you have in your house. Yes, what yeah. can you possibly watch on 22? There aren't that many channels. Well, we have, ca you know, you have cable now. You can watch things from Toledo, you know, if you want to. You can watch cooking shows from Akron. And, and I just really like, I like the fact that it's all moving, and it's, and it's at the same time, all those people are stars. They go home and, you know, yeah, I have my own cooking show. You know, and to their family, right. that's, you know. But the, the thing is, like, you can catch things out of context. School's Out, the song School's Out was our biggest hit, you know. That came out of a Bowery Boys movie. You, you know, you're watching and sort of listening, and, and Sa uh, Muggsy said to Satch, hey, school's out, hit him with his hat. What he meant was wise up in that, you know, context. And, I went, and that struck me. I was, oh, that's, what a great way to say that. Now, I wasn't listening to the rest of the movie, but I caught that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things, you just catch out of context, and I think it's a great pop art, you know, thing. When you watch the 22 sets, do you ever just uh, come in on the primetime programs on the networks, or do you go for the things that are on the cable more, the Toledo? Oh, no, no, I watch, I, I like, you know, the real... American things, and totally all American, what people are watching in America. Because, you know, I sort of don't represent what people are watching in America, which is great, you know. Uh, for some reason, I have the license to, to sort of get away with things, you know, which is nice. I thank you all for that. But, uh, but if, if that, it's that all, I'm an all American guy, really. And, you know, and, and in TV, it's, you know, I get accused of being a nationalist when, I, nationalist when I leave America. I go to Europe and I say, boy, it's so inconvenient here. No pizza at four in the morning. You know, TV, TV is off at 8 o'clock, you know. I sat in England and watched a two-hour special on soybeans. <laughs> Saturday night at 9 o'clock, that uh, that's what was on. And I sat there and I watched it, and I thought something was going to happen, you know. Nothing happened. The next day interviews, I knew everything about soybeans. That's all I talked about. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> but, but really, the all-American thing, I really, uh, TV is, is, a great, is a great thing, you know. After you have finished a road trip and you go back to your home in California, how much do you guard your privacy? keep the outside world away from you and your family for a time. Well, that's, you know, that is important, you know. Even I'm on the map, you know. Mm -hmm. you know so I, what I do is I hire, to keep the image up, I, I rent this big black castle up there and I hire a hundred actors to be like townspeople, you know. <laughs> so they, because they expect people to pitch for, kill the monster, you know. <laughs> that keeps the image up and they, they think I live there, right? I actually live down the street. You know, it's, in L.A. especially, you, if you're on the map, you don't have any privacy at all. You know. No, you can't just sail into Chasen's and have a oh, quiet dinner no, I, because there are... I can't are... go anywhere. I really can't, you know. I love going to baseball games and things like that, and I just can't, you know. T Tupperware parties. Well, but what... <laughs> what if you were to maybe... I mean, you could disguise oh, yourself as... A, on I was going to say, you could disguise yourself as a normal-looking person, you know, yeah, and there's then... one person to say, Hey, Alex! <laughs> you know, and then I'll say, oh, no. And then they, but, but I, see, I can't say no when it comes to autographs. I think it's a real compliment for somebody to ask you for your autograph. Mm -hmm. But that's also Even though you know that in one day or one year, it will be in the wastebasket. Oh, yeah. It's it a matter. great compliment for somebody to say, sure. may I have your autograph? Sure. Well, but the, yeah. Fortunately, I'm not able to write, so I, <laughs> yeah, I, I conduct that. We, I, the, and the great thing is well, that is like you get a guy that doesn't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want him to know it. I want it for me. I had a, a Hell's Angel one time, or a great big biker, and he came out and he says, it's for my girlfriend, you know. I said, well, what name do you want? He says, Spike. <laughs> <laughs> And it said Spike on his jacket, too. <laughs> he really boxed me out on that one. But you agree, oh, okay, great. But, you know, that, that is funny. And then people also say, it's not for me. I, I, as long as I'm here, I might as well get one, too. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> you know, it's... I collect autographs. I collect all villain autographs. Like? Uh, I have Bella Lugosi. Um, I have... Uh, Pull the Ron string! Bella Lugosi. I have uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. I have uh, the Prince Charles, the, who is Jack the Ripper. 
the Duke of Windsor. Uh, Duke of Windsor, is that right? <laughs> no, they, they actually found out that was, That's right. you know, that was the Jack the Ripper. He was next in line to be the king. And he was, you know, he was Jack the Ripper. I think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And all the, you know, great villains. I like villains. So, you know. Alice has Have one you? more. <laughs> Alice has one more number for us. And uh, I think I'm correct. It's called Under My Wheels. Yes. Is that correct? If you would get back and get set with your organization, I will give you the introduction. Here once again is uh, Alice Cooper. The song is called Under My Wheels. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So I think... Along with David Letterman, I really think Tom Snyder is one of the greatest interviewers, and Johnny Carson, uh, in terms of television that I've ever seen. I just think he's fantastic. God rest his soul. I'm glad I could go on the air and talk. I've played it ad nauseum a couple times on the Pod Blast. My call in to the Tom, late, late show with Tom Snyder on CBS back on September 20th, 1996, talking with uh, Malcolm McDowell. And I made Tom laugh. It's not about me, but it's just, it, I'm glad that I had that exchange. And I can't believe I made it through. I mean, I got busy signal after busy signal after busy signal. Kind of like when I talked with Larry King in 88 on the radio. Couldn't believe I got through. And he loved my name. He goes, Chance, that Chance, that's your real name? I never heard that before. I said, yeah. And then he named one of his sons Chance. I don't think it's delusional, delusional to think that he may have remembered that name because I've got to find that tape. I have that on an audio cassette tape somewhere. I need to actually go through my miles and miles of audio tape and find this and some other things too, like some phone pranks that I did impersonating the assistant principal where I prank called cheerleaders who would never, ever date geek shrimp chance. And I accused them of smoking in the West Wing bathroom. And I said, either smoking, he had a southern accent. I go, either smoking stops or the cheerleading will. And I hear this girl go, I don't even smoke, Mom, believe me. It was terrible, terrible. And the next day, there was a line of parents outside that assistant principal's office <laughs> saying, What the hell are you talking about? My daughter doesn't smoke. Anyway, I did an impression of Larry Whaley. Anyway, um, let's move on to birthdays here. So, by the way, happy 74th birthday to the great Alice Cooper. I spent a lot of time, and I'm not sorry, on Alice Cooper. He's, he's, and sorry I, I mangled the pronunciation of his uh, alter ego last name there. People are probably cursing me. You poser! All right, moving on. Happy heavenly birthday to screenwriter, director, and producer George A. Romero, who was the father of the on-screen zombie. Romero was born Sunday, February 4th, 1940, in the Bronx, New York. With nine friends, including screenwriter John A. Russo, George A. Romero formed Image 10 Productions in the late 1960s. This is the production company that produced the classic Night of the Living Dead, which was released theatrically in cinemas on October 1st, 1968. The movie was directed by George Romero and co-written by John A. Russo. The movie became a cult classic and a defining moment for modern horror cinema, which earned $30 million in movie ticket sales and only cost $120,000 to produce. The three films that Romero created that followed Night of the Living Dead were There's Always Vanilla in 1971, Jack's Wife slash Season of the Witch in 1972, not to be confused with Halloween 3 Season of the Witch uh, 10 years later, and The Crazies, released in 1973. Now, those weren't as well received as Night of the Living Dead or some of his later work. The Crazies dealt with a biospill that induces an epidemic of homicidal madness. Also, the critically acclaimed Martin was released in 1978, a film that deals with the vampire myth. Those were two well-known films he did after Night of the Living Dead. George Romero returned to the zombie genre in 1978 with Dawn of the Dead, which was shot in Pennsylvania, also shot in Pennsylvania State, along with Night of the Living Dead in a shopping mall. Tom Savini did some of the gore makeup shots of intestines, and there's a great gag, as they call it, which means a stunt of a zombie having its head lopped off by a helicopter blade. That one always made an impression on me. And of course you have to kill the brains to kill a zombie, whether it's with a bullet, 
a machete, or a chopper blade. Chopper is an helicopter. Dawn of the Dead's my favorite of the trilogy. So anyway, Dawn of the Dead was shot on a budget of $1.5 million in a shopping mall in Pennsylvania, filmed in 78, released in, filmed in 77, released in 78, and it earned over $55 million internationally and was later named one of the top cult films by Entertainment Weekly magazine back in 2003, almost 20 years ago. Wow, time flies. Uh, and then George A. Romero made a third entry in his Dawn of the Dead, Day, Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead trilogy with Day of the Dead in 1985. And Greg Nicotero, that was the first movie Greg Nicotero did makeup effects for. And he wound up forming his own makeup special effects house called KNB Effects. And he now is a director, a rather excellent director, directing episodes of Walking Dead and other productions. Uh, so he does not just makeup. He doesn't only have a whole team of talented makeup artists, but he's also a director as well. Now, between Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, uh, Romero shot Night Riders with a K, like Night in the chess game, Night Riders in 1981. Like Knight Rider, the TV show in 82, Michael Knight, um, spelled with a K. Another movie festival favorite about a group of modern day jousters who reenact tournaments on motorcycles. And then he did Creep Show, released in 82, is about to have its 40th anniversary this November. And that was written by Stephen King. And it was an anthology, meaning a series of several stories, like an episode of like Twilight Zone, the movie, for instance. Um, it's an anthology of tongue-in-cheek tales modeled after 1950s horror comics, like the E-comics, um, horror comics, pre-code comics. So the cult classic success of Creep Show, which had a great cast, by the way. Let's see, you had Ted Danson in it right before Cheers, the sitcom started, Leslie Nielsen, Adrian Barbeau, um, oh, God, what's his name? Um, oh, I'm having a brain fart. How, uh, how, 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 I got to look this up. I can't believe it. It's not entering my little tiny mind right now. Uh, how, let's see, not how, 9,000, how, Holbrook, how Holbrook. Thank you. How Holbrook was in Creep Show. And E.G. Marshall was in the great segment with all the roaches. He was afraid of bugs. He didn't like bugs. And he was some a-hole living in a penthouse. Really mean mean, miserly type guy who gets his comeuppance at the hands of cockroaches and other insects. Now, the success of Creepshow led to the creation of George Romero's Tales from the Dark Side, a horror anthology television series like The Outer Limits and Twilight Zone. Anthology, of course, means it's just, it's not it doesn't have a regular cast of characters or a regular story. It's different stories each week. And it aired from 1983 until 1988 in syndicated television land, meaning on independent stations in the United States of America and abroad. As the decade of the 80s drew to a close, George Romero directed Monkey Shines in 1988 about a service animal. George Romero died Sunday, July 16th, 2017 at the age of 77 in Toronto, Canada. George was born on a Sunday, and he died on a Sunday. On November 10th, 2022, Creepshow celebrates its 40th anniversary of release in North America. Rest in peace, George A. Romero, who was a pioneer in film, the horror genre, and pop culture. I don't think there would be a Walking Dead television show if not for George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. In fact, I am... Um, I went to the first zombie school, one of the classes, and right before they shot the pilot of The Walking Dead, and, and we saw clips of um, Night of the Living Dead and uh, Dawn of the Dead. And that's how they wanted the walkers to act. They didn't want the walkers, or zombies, if you will, to be fast. Now, everyone, you've seen it. Most people have seen The Walking Dead by now. Of course, my gosh, it's a runaway hit show for AMC. But they wanted the slow, you know, lumbering zombie um, they wanted that terror 
and that they could sense sound and smells and anyway and so they didn't want fast zombies like you saw in like world war z movies like that and anyway or zombie land anyway um moving on no clip from george a romero um on february 5th we celebrate the heavenly birthday of henry Home Run King Aaron, otherwise known as Hank Aaron, who was born on Monday, February 5th, 1934, in Mobile, Alabama. Hank Aaron played 23 seasons of Major League Baseball from 1954 until 1976. And on Monday, April 8th, 1974, Hank Aaron of the Atlanta Braves hit his 715th career home run, breaking Babe Ruth's legendary record of 714 homers. Ultimately, Hank Aaron hit 755 career home runs, as most people realize. And the last Major League Baseball game that Hank Aaron played was on Sunday, October 3rd, 1976, as a Milwaukee Brewer. Unfortunately, the great Hank Aaron passed away on Friday, January 22nd, 2021, at the age of 86. So that's a wrap on birthdays. I sort of, I'll get to the other ones next year. I just, I don't want to have another six hour gab fest. I realize that is ridiculous. Time for item, the nostalgic treat of the week. This time we're talking about the slush puppy. At this time of year, it's winter 2022. God, I'm getting that hum again. Oh, hang on a second here. God bless America. All right, the slush puppy as most realize, is a frozen beverage. So it's kind of a weird time of the year to talk about it, but be that as it may. The Slush Puppy was created in 1970 and was marketed both directly by the Slush Puppy division of J&J Snack Foods and through its Slush Puppy distributors in the United States. A Slush Puppy dessert or drink, sugary drink, sugary syrupy drink, has two major components. The base and the flavoring. I made them. I worked at a drugstore called Super X Drugstore, and they had a slush puppy machine. And I had so many of those for free. Lemon, lime, and cherry were my favorite. And they're really tart. It's not really sweet. It's a tart, tart confection. And it's just like frozen ice, but it's not as good as like a snow cone to me because it's real syrupy. But let's talk about those two main ingredients. The base is made from a special syrup that is mixed from water, was mixed with water, and then is frozen. This creates a mixture, like slush, hence the name, a mixture resulting in pellets of ice in a sweet liquid. The taste is simply that of the flavored syrup. The brand's mascot is a cute white puppy named Chili Dog, wearing a blue shirt with the letter S and a knit hat. Like I said, I like the lemon lime flavor and uh, and cherry, but lemon lime was my favorite slush puppy. The original owners, Will Radcliffe, who lived from 1939 to 2014, and his sister Phyllis and their mother Thelma came up with the name slush puppy while sitting on their front porch in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the way, the Bengals are in the Super Bowl for the first time in 30 years, as most people realize. Or they were in the Super Bowl, I should say, depending on when you're listening to this pod blast in 2022. So they were in Cincinnati, Ohio as well. And the business started from a home address in Cincinnati and progressed to a single door, small warehouse, to a manufacturing plant and warehouse, to a candy and tobacco distributor, to a front door repair shop, to finally a showplace building that overlooks the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. Under Radcliffe, Slush Puppy grew to $25 million in annual sales. Radcliffe sold Slush Puppy to Cadbury Schweppes. Cadbury is in the Cadbury Chocolates and Schweppes is in Ginger Ale for $16.6 million in the year 2000. In the year 2000, Slush Puppy was then acquired by J&J Snack Foods, a.k.a. otherwise known as the Icy Corporation, the Icy frozen treat you'd find in Kmart's when you're a kid. They had the Coca-Cola and the cherry icy. Anyway, and a food manufacturer based in New Jersey. 
Yeah, that's J&J Snack Foods. They're based in New Jersey. And so that deal was done on Tuesday, May 30th, 2006. No clip, no commercial. I just wanted to talk about the slush puppy, which you can still find to this day. Time for the nostalgic toy of the week as we start to get in the home stretch of this week's nostalgic pod blast. I'm going to play a commercial for you now. And I'll give you a hint. These are toys that you could get on an airplane when you were a kid. If you're a Generation Xer, you most likely, at one point in your life, if you ever flew, that is. Some people have never been on an airplane in their entire lives. But if you ever did fly when you were a kid to visit your grandparents or for whatever reason, you probably got these toys. Let's listen to a vintage commercial, and we'll reveal what this toy is. This is from film, so the audio is a little sketchy. Come closer. See, I'm Miss Cookie from Color Forms Lane. Won't you come into my kitchen? A Color Forms kitchen, see? Color Forms. With magical plastic dishes and cupboards you can open and close. A stove. And oh, yes, the milk from the refrigerator. Color Forms. You know, press to stick on and look to remove. No scissors, paste, or paint needed. And they never, never, never wear out. When the party's over, just put the dishes in the sink and the pots in the pantry. And we're all cleaned up. Don't forget, for real fun, get Miss Cookie's Kitchen by Color Forms. <laughs> Miss Cookie, that's me. Oh, there's Pot Boy, Daddy. And olive oil and Bluto, too. They're all in the Popeye cartoon kit by Color Forms. Who's Peter, though? Daddy, look. His body's running away. I know who it is. It's Pop Boy. What muscles he has. Oh, boy. Oh, brother. It's color forms. All right, that's not the best clip. I have another clip that's very, very brief. I think will be more nostalgic for you. But let's talk about color forms. That's right, color forms you got on airplanes. At least I did. On Eastern Airlines, which, of course, is defunct now. But color forms is a creative toy named for the simple shapes and forms cut from the colored vinyl sheeting that clung to a smooth backing surface surface without adhesives that would peel you would peel them and move them around on the board and these pieces are used to create picture graphics and designs which can then be changed countless times by repositioning the removable color forms the name also refers to the specific registered trademark brand these products are produced under as well as the company that manufactures the toys called color forms brand llc sets initially featured basic geometric shapes and bright primary colors on black or white backgrounds eventually however the color forms line evolves to include full color illustrated play sets games and puzzles interactive books and creative activity sets for children of all ages the licensing of media properties related to contemporary pop culture became integral integral to the product and the company's success and growth since its inception more than a billion color forms play sets have been produced and sold the color forms concept was developed by harry and patricia kyslevitz in 1951 firmly rooted in the modernist design and reflecting the color field abstract style prevalent at the time the basic concept behind color forms is the ability to adhere and reposition abstract and geometric color form shapes on random surfaces to create artwork. Both recent art students, the couple discovered, both were recent art students, and they discovered the idea when they acquired several rolls of flexible paper-thin colored vinyl used to manufacture plastic pocketbooks and found that it would stick to the glossy paint in their bathroom and allow them to reposition it at will without affecting either surface. Simply cutting shapes out of the material and sticking them to the wall turned out to be amusing enough that they let extra vinyl, that they left extra vinyl with a pair of scissors for guests to add to their creations. The positive reactions they got to the project led Harry to believe there was a market and market potential for such a product. The original color form sets 
were spiral-bound booklets, hand-assembled by the husband and wife team in the New York City apartment. The first 1,000 sets were sold on concept to FAO Schwartz Toy Store. Shallow boxed sets containing screen printed die cut pieces and illustrated backgrounds began appearing soon thereafter. The company used the slogan, quote, it's more fun to play the color forms way, unquote, in print and television commercials that they used to promote their products. Prominent graphic designer Paul Rand was commissioned to create the company logo that remains in use to this very day. He also gave input for a signature edition playset. The company rarely employed an in-house creative staff, relying instead on the Kislevitz's own artistic direction provided to top freelance illustrators for layouts and finished work. Indeed, even the company's creative director from 1965 until 1986, toy designer and inventor Mel Bernkrant, was not a formal Color Forms employee, working instead from a royalty percentage. The defining feature of most, most Color Forms playsets is their signature plastic stick-ons, trademark, that can be placed and repositioned on top of graphic backgrounds to create endless scenes and scenarios at a child's whim. I'm going to play one quick commercial. Here's a licensed version of the color forms from the late 1970s. And this kind of ties into what I talk about a lot on the Nostalgic Pod Blast. And then we'll get into this week's taglines game. With Color Form's Incredible Hulk adventure set. I'll be the Incredible Hulk. I'll you can pretend Hulk. lots of things. Huh? Like the Hulk is battling his arch enemy Rhino. Or using his incredible strength against the Abomination. Wow. Or single-handedly capturing a gang of evildoers. You can pretend lots of exciting adventures. With your imagination and Color Form's Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk adventure set comes with 24 plastic playing pieces. It's Color Form fun. I loved color forms as a kid. Um, and again, you, you get them on airplanes like Eastern Airlines, TWA. It, it was a lot of fun. So, But now, 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 now we play, play a, a game. game. Shall, Shall we play, play a game? game? It's my impression of the War Games computer in the movie War Games starring Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy. Shall we play a game? Yes, we will. We're going to play taglines. It's time for taglines as we wrap up the show. This week... I have seven more movie taglines for you. So I'm going to give you the tagline and think about what this movie title is. And these aren't too obvious. But if you think about it, you can figure out what these movies are. So since I have seven, let's start with this tagline. They were seven. And they fought like 700. I'm going to pause while you think and while I pull up a clip. They were seven. And they fought like 700. Seven, seven, seven. The Magnificent Seven. Here you go. They were only seven, but they fought like 700. To bring the kind of justice that would last. Seven, seven, seven. The Magnificent Seven. Ride on. Ride on. Somehow I don't think you solved my problem. Solving your problems isn't in our line. We deal in lead, friend. So do I. We're in the same business, huh? Only as competitors. So that's where they were. You hit them. Yeah, sure, they hit them. But she won't tell me where. They're afraid. She's afraid of me, you, him, all of us. Farmers. Their families told them we'd rape them. Stay 
Steve McQueen. Charles Bronson, James Coburn, among others. Magnificent Seven. Released on October 12th, 1960, it cost $2 million to produce, but it made $9.75 million. So next up, here's another tagline for you. Back this up. I don't want to give it away on my clip. Okay, here's the tagline. You ready? Tagline two of seven. There's a movie tagline, obviously. A man went looking for America. And he couldn't find it anywhere. You know that movie? Again, the tagline is, on the movie posters and in the advertising, tagline, a man went looking for America and he couldn't find it anywhere. It was released July 14th, 1969 in New York City. Big hit. The production budget was around $400,000, but the box office take was $60 bucks. It was a tremendous success and had kind of a downer ending. It was this movie. Easy Rider. Like the magazine. This year, the judges of the Cannes Film Festival presented the award Best Film by a New Director to Easy Rider. It's the story of a man who went looking for America and couldn't find it anywhere. Easy Rider stars Peter Fonda. It's not every man that can live off the land, you know. You do your own thing in your own time. You should be proud. Also starring Dennis Hopper, the award-winning director of Easy Rider. Man, look, I gotta get out of here, man. We got things we want to do, man. Like, I, 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 I gotta get out of here, man. Co-starring Jack Nicholson. I got to see her see, uh, scissor happy, beautify America thing going on around here. They're trying to make everybody look like you, old Brenner. <laughs> I gotta watch it with the music rights. The bots are gonna get me. I gotta talk over these songs. Like, Born to be Wild. Bots are out to get me. Got chicken, man. That's what happened. Hey, you got a rope? Hey, mister, can you tell where a man might find a bed? Great soundtrack. I never really thought of myself as a freak. Yeah, man. But I love to freak. No, man. This is grass. Yeah, man. Smoke it. You mean marijuana? Look like a bunch didn't of cheese from a gorilla lovin'. Oh, I just can't believe. What are they doing here? I'm bitten in hell. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't think they'll I smoked about bitten in hell. Hey, oh, look at them green. Oh, I don't know, stop. Stop. Look at me. I wouldn't lie to you. I didn't inhale it. They're not scared of you. they scared of what you represent. <laughs> I wouldn't lie to you. Oh, we represent to them, man. There's somebody who needs a haircut. Oh, no. I wouldn't lie to you. What you represent to them is freedom. What the hell's wrong with freedom, man? That's what it's all about. All right, I got to stop the clip. The cut. Stop the tape. Stop the tape. You're going to get busted. So what a great song that is, though. Moving on to number four out of seven movie taglines. Before the bot shut my ass down. Here's the tagline for the movie. That's number three, actually. Here's the third one. Here's the, t- did I say four? I meant third. Here's the third out of seven taglines. You wish it was four. You're ready for the show to be over if you're still listening. Tagline. The happiest sound in the world. Boy, all these noise in my 
this was a sensitive mic, ain't it? The happiest sound in the world. Well, I'm going to play a clip, of course, from the original trailer. The movie was released in 1965. The Robert Wise production of Roger and Hammerstein's... Roger Hitchstein's... <laughs> The Sound of Music, I Can't Play It, starring Julie Andrews, Angela Cartwright, uh, Nicholas Hammond was one of the Von Trapp children. Yeah, The Sound of Music, released March 2nd, 1965, a massive blockbuster which cost $8.2 million to make, yet earned a whopping $286.2 million buckaroos. Actually photographed amidst the wondrous beauties of Salzburg, Austria. With Julie Andrews, Academy Award winner for Best Actress of the Year in Walt Disney's Mary Poppins. Now in the new and glorious role of Maria. How do you solve the problem? That's right. I can't play the song, so we're going to stop it right there. Sound of music. So let's move on to the fourth tagline. Here's the tagline. When he pours, he rains. Not rains as in raindrops. Rains as in rains on a horse. R-E-I-G. N-S. R-E, R-E-I-G-N-S. Yeah. When he pours, he rains. What movie would that be? Think about it for a sec. One square mile of this saloon lies the greatest concentration Time's up. of wealth in the world. Yes. Tom, Tom Cruise was in it. Gonna get his hands on any of it. This is the big time. Are you ready for the big time, young Mr. Flanagan? I think I can handle it. This isn't what I ordered. Cocktail! Get your act together! A white wine! All right. Now, what was it that you ordered? A martini! What's in that? In many ways, the fool a customer. You will learn them all. Yes, Obi-Wan. You get the women, you get the bucks. And you can see the color of their panties, and you know you got talent. Stick with me, son, I'll make you a star. Working for me. This is a real opportunity. Jet set bartender, right? The Caribbean Jamaica mug. Hey, buy a drink? My rum specialty's perhaps? Bartender with the lime perfect. The bartender. Now, he's about to be swept off his feet. Should stay here forever. By the one thing he didn't expect. Don't tell me Brian Flanagan is your love. Side to side to from Touch Tone Pictures. He's gonna do a number on you, mate. This is Cocktail. One night stand. You made a move on her? I'm your friend, you dumbass! Well, I don't have any friends! As of now, that is for sure! Your sexy little smile's not gonna work this time. What the hell is this? That's for you. Elizabeth Shoe. $10,000. Is that all your daughter's worth? You think I'm letting some bartender walk into my family? I love you. I want to marry you. Throw this bum out of here! You're so hung up on money. See this? Jordan! This is how hung up on money I am. And as for the way I feel about you, I wish you never know. This is like a takeoff, like a hipper um, version of a. Dirty Dancing or something. Kind of like a hit version of that or something. There you go, cocktail. All right, so let's move on. Tagline. Tagline number five of seven for movies. Here's the tagline. Ready for it? You don't assign him to murder cases. You just turn him loose. Repeating. Tagline. You don't assign him to murder cases. You just turn him loose. Yeah. Let's listen to a clip. This is about a movie about a couple of killers. Harry Callahan. And a homicidal maniac. (laughs) 
the one with the badge is Harry. Oh! There were a lot of reasons they called him Dirty Harry. There it is. And he kept inventing new ones. <laughs> That was a pretty good pinch you made yesterday. The chief was pleased. He was, huh? Yeah, he really was. He wanted me to tell you, well done. I tell you how deeply moved I am. How do you like that? I pass along a compliment? You could at least be a little bit polite. It might not even kill you to say thanks. <laughs> I'd much rather say thanks to a raise. Hey, Harry, check communications. Something from Chicago. A gun nut. I'm putting somebody with you. Well, you know what happens to the guys that I've worked with. Dietrich's still in the hospital with a bullet in his gut, and Fanducci's dead. Now, you're working with Gonzalez or you're not working. Now, that's straight from the fifth floor. You got it? I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, to tell you the truth, in all this excitement, I've kind of lost track myself. But being this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and would blow your head clean off, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Doesn't it drive your wife crazy? No. Nope. You know, she got used to it. No, she never did, really. Well, what then? She's dead. Oh, please forgive me. She was driving home late one night, and the drunk crossed the center line. There's no reason for it, really. I'm so sorry. It's OK. Look, I want you to tell Chico that I understand you know, him quitting. I, I think he's right. This is no life for you, too. Why do you stay in it, then? I don't know. I really don't. Send Inspector Callahan in. Mr. Mayor, Inspector Callahan. All right. Let's have it. Have what? Your report. What have you been doing? Oh, well, for the past three quarters of an hour, I've been sitting on my ass in your outer office, waiting on you. Damn it all, Harry, that's the mayor you're talking to. Clint Eastwood. Detective Harry Callahan. You don't assign him. Stop! To murder cases. You just <laughs> turn him loose. Now, what the hell is he doing up there? That was a messed up movie, man. The villain in that who, like, wanted to be abused and killed. Man, that was a creepy movie. And boy, Dirty Harry released in 1971 on, of all days, Christmas Eve. Christ, no, not Christmas Eve. December 23rd, 71. Hey, that's my, my nephew Henry's birthday, December 23rd. Anyways, released December 23rd, 1971. It cost $4 million to make, but it earned $36 million. So it was a tremendous hit. And of course, you had all the sequels. And I remember Sudden Impact. That was my favorite of that series. And I never told you this about Cocktail. Backing up to the Tom Cruise movie, Cocktail was released. I don't think I mentioned this. July 29th, 1988. It cost $20 million, but Cocktail earned $171.5 million. A tremendous success for Touchstone Pictures. And Warner Brothers released Dirty Harry. So now we're on tagline six out of seven. Here's a movie tagline for you. Tagline. The mission is a man. The mission is a man. What do you think that is? It was released July 24th, 1998. The mission is a man. It cost $70 million, but it made a whopping $482.3 million at the box office. Tremendous success. Spielberg was behind it for DreamWorks. Mr. Brian Boyd. No doubt by now you have received Paramount full pictures. information about the untimely death of your son. However, there are some personal details that Believe I very strongly in No what words of mine can ever He was a fine him. soldier. And regarding the circumstances he leading to his death. He felt his loss tremendously. His Robert's commanding his officer. His heroic service to his country. He was a great soldier. A dedicated friend. The grace of God and the aid of your Those son, of us I'm alive. Please today. accept my most sincere condolences. He will live in our memories. to you my deepest sympathy. 
Colonel, I've got something you should know about. Yes. These two men died in Normandy. This one at Omaha Beach. Sean Ryan. This one in Utah. Peter Ryan. This man was killed last week in New Guinea. Daniel Ryan. The three men are brothers, sir. I've just learned that this afternoon their mother's getting all three telegrams. That's not all. There's a fourth brother, the youngest. He's somewhere in Normandy. We don't know where. That boy's alive. We're gonna send somebody to find him. And we're gonna get him the hell out of there. Some private in the 101st lost three of his brothers and he's got a ticket home. It's not gonna be easy finding one particular soldier in the whole damn war. success saving private ryan or saving ryan's privates have you no it's a very very deep awesome movie by spielberg all right final tagline final tagline tagline number seven of seven this is a classic hear the pictures see the music Hear the pictures, see the music. Well, it was from this animated classic from way back in 1940. Fantasia. Originally released on November 13th, 1940. The film budget was 2.8 million the equivalent of back then, and it made $80 million in the United States of America and in Canada. One of the greatest movies of all time. Certainly one of the greatest animated movies. Cutting edge. For Walt Disney. Great visuals. Awesome characters were introduced. It captured the imagination of children and adults alike. The great. Fantasia with that wonderful animation. You should watch this trailer. Um, it's so visual. If you're listening at fistfulofradio.com overnight or Monday night at 7 or Saturday and Sunday at 2 in the afternoon, Eastern Time, Atlanta, Georgia time, you can't see this. So I would direct you to YouTube and search Fantasia 1940 theatrical trailer. It's incredible. Award-winning, that great musical score. And that's our final tagline for the week. We'll do it again next week with a different series of taglines. But movies will be a topic that I go to often because there's so many. So many movies, so many taglines. Walt Disney. In Technicolor, Fantasia, our final tagline of the week. Love it. Now, I have a, <laughs> a movie to talk about as we close, up, close down the show. Just a few more clips, literally, and the, the show's going to be over. I think I'm going to make it within five hours, under five hours for a change. I've been going at six hours the last several pod blasts, which is insane. That I can do that that long by myself, and also because the because nobody's gonna listen that long unless they listen in stages. And, and frankly, I'm not that good. 
where you'd want to listen to every moment of that. So am I wasting my time? I hope not. I need content for Fistful of Radio. That's why I go long. But, and there, you know, sometimes I think I could have cut that out. I should have had, I could have edited a whole section, like a whole hour out of a pod blast. But when you're live, you can't really do that. And by the way, you remember this, a friend of mine uh, named Hunter reminded me of this uh, hunter golson's his name he reminded me of these movies clip movies like terror in the isles in like the early 1980s those were cool movies like because they would show it's literally a clip show it would show memorable scenes you know it would be hosted by people like nancy allen who was an actress um, she was in robocop and dressed to kill and blow out with john travolta she had a hot career for a while in the 80s and uh and she hosted this thing and golly, that noise is driving me up the wall. You hear that, folks? I'm sorry. Let me try to try to fix that. There. I think I got it. I'm an audio snob now, ever since I started working in radio. Um, I've been a listener of radio for <laughs> since I was a kid. I love radio. But anyway, radio, podcasts. So I, I demand perfection with the audio. God dang it. And it's pissing me off this bad friggin' connection i don't want to use bad language i really don't okay so um another one was that's entertainment and that was a clip show of movie musicals and i thought they were pretty neat uh but they came and went that little fad it didn't last long the fad of the clip movie but terror in the isles was good i like that and that's entertainment and there were several that's entertainment movies so speaking of movies i want to talk about this movie it's a little movie. It's a sequel from 1983 called Superman 3. Why am I mentioning this? I'm glad you asked. Not that you really asked. Um, holding up for the camera now, the soundtrack album. And it's the movie poster. It shows Richard Pryor in the arms of Christopher Reeve as Superman. And there's, there's a blooper on the movie poster and the soundtrack record album. Let me see how it looks in the monitor. I want to see if you can see the air. God, and if this thing might fall and knock my camera down. Okay, pay attention to Superman. That's where the blooper is. Well, I'll just tell you, for those listening, this won't be, uh, this won't make any sense and you won't care. Okay, look at Superman's cape. He's got no ass. I mean, no S, not ass, S. The S is missing. There's a, there's a yellow S on the back of Superman's cape in all of the movies. But whoever made the movie poster, whoever drew that, and I should know the artist's name, effed up and left the S off. Now, I love Richard Pryor, a big fan of his, and he had some of the best scenes in Superman 3. If you just don't consider it a superhero movie, which it was, it had some cool serious moments with like a woman that gets turned into a robot, one of the villains, and and then you had uh, Superman fighting himself when the character that Richard Pryor plays, August Gorman, or Gus Gorman, Gus for short, for August He's trying to create synthetic kryptonite, and he can't find the unknown ingredient, so he adds tar, and that makes Superman evil. He presents it to Superman, and anyway, that, that was one of the cool scenes where Clark Kent fights his alter ego, the evil Superman. But I do want to play just a couple interviews of promotions of Christopher Reeve and Richard Pryor promoting Superman 3, and then we are going to close out the show. And there's a reason I'm mentioning all this. But let me, uh, and it leads into a movie called Office Space from 1999 with Jennifer Aniston and Ron Livingston uh, and Michael Cole. I love that movie. It's underrated. It's a comedy. But let me play. Let's just pretend. Let's go back in time to 1983. And here's the great long gone Christopher Reeve on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Let's listen as we wind down this week's pod blast. see you. Very well. I wonder if one of those kids can do the call for It's a Bird, It's a Plane. It's a Bird, It's a Plane. Aren't they great? That was wonderful. That is, did you ever do anything like that as a kid? No. I couldn't possibly. I used to be able to do a chicken. <laughs> yeah, I would get oh, up close like this and go, shoot. Oh, I should have been in that contest. Sure. Mm -hmm. What have you been up to? I haven't seen you for a while. Well, I just came out uh, over the weekend because my friend Robin Williams has a little boy named Zachary, and I'm the godfather. And yeah, uh, Zachary is uh, two months old, and we had his christening on Sunday. But uh, his christening was up in Marin County. And for those of you home at New Jersey don't know about Marin County, that's where, like, yeah. 
That's where the, the quarterback on the football team goes, you know, like hike if the energy. <laughs> Yeah, okay, no. I'm a laid-back community. So we kind of, we show up a little early and there's nobody there and the minister comes down and we go up and say, uh, uh, is it starting? I mean, what time's it happening? Three o'clock? He goes, whenever. Whenever. Yeah. <laughs> like hike. And then he stands on this rug and he says like, now let's all gather together and share the space with this beautiful child. And we're going, oh no, we're in real trouble here. But I tell you something, it ended up really beautifully and, and little Zachary was looking up like, okay, okay, well, that's fine. Good, I got it. Speaking of Robin, he's going to be with us next week or this week? Next yeah. week, I guess. Didn't uh, somebody told me you both studied, I guess at the same time, or was it the same yeah. time, under John, with John Hausman? Yes, we were classmates at Juilliard. And John Hausman had just won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for the Paper Chase. And uh, they keep calling you in for these uh, conferences where they talk about your work and how you're doing, and stuff like that. And at one point he said, Mr. Reeve, it is very important that you become a serious classical actor. Unless, of course, they offer you a load of money to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I took something else. I saw Robin on a home box office special, do John Hausman reading the telephone book. Mm -hmm. It's all it was. It was hysterical. <laughs> he came out with a, with a Hausman look, you know, and picked up the telephone book and just read names. Adams. <laughs> And he goes, Anthony. And the longer he did, the funnier it got. Yeah. How long did you uh, stay at Juilliard with? I was there for a year. I went for a postgraduate year. Uh -huh. And then uh, the deal was I was going to do a television uh, show uh, to make some money to pay for my studies. Right. But then the character, I guess it was a compliment. The character started getting popular, and I had to finally drop out of school. Right. So. You spoke with Robin's son. Your son's about, what, four or five? No, like he's, uh, he's three and a half. Feels like four or five. Yeah. Does he, but, uh, has he seen the Superman movies yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's great. See, now, can I'm, he differentiate at that age between, of course, he knows it's you and he knows it's fantasy and reality, but sometimes kids at that when age... When I was that age, I thought that the people you're seeing on television got around the back and went in the little box and were performing. They were all about that big, you know? Matthew's got it totally figured out. He knows it comes from someplace else and this is not reality and Dad pretends and it's all make-believe. His little friend asked him in the park the other day, what does your daddy do? And he said... My daddy's an actor, you know? He's got that sorted so out. So he's got that straight. Yeah. Yeah. Were you that... Uh, kids, I think, are a little more... Even at that age now, they are more sophisticated than... They we catch were on quick. He, yeah. saw, he sat there and saw uh, Superman 3 with me at a screening. Yeah. And he loved it. He's just mesmerized. But there is a part there that's somewhat scary for a child. Right. And um, it comes out okay in the end, folks. Don't worry. Right. But uh, it was really something, being there with him, plus seeing me on the screen, and sort of having to tell him that... Because the belief, you know? He's, right. like, totally hooked on it. That's good. Well, anyway, we're gonna, we got a film clip. But Richard Pryor is in this with you, isn't he? Oh, is he ever? He's yeah. great. Oh. He's wonderful. <laughs> What, what, is, what kind of a role is Richard playing this? Well, the first thing is, you know, you, you, you wonder how they're going to get Superman and Richard Pryor in the same movie, yeah. you, know? <laughs> <laughs> that, you know? That in itself is worth five bucks to go yeah. find out. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he, he plays uh, an unemployed computer genius. He's a guy who's right. sort of like a dishwasher, and he doesn't know what a, what a genius he is, and he ends up working for the bad guys, and one thing leads to another, but you got to see. All right, we're going to show you a little, uh, about a two-minute clip here of uh, Superman 3. You want me to do the commercial first, Fred? Was that what that wonderful signal was? We're not like those. I thought no. the arthritis was that kind of <laughs> <laughs> We'll do this first, then we'll come back and see a little bit of Superman 3. There we are. Talking with Chris Reeves about Superman 3. Are you uh, having fun with the character still? Yes. Superman? Finding new... new yes, I am. And uh, the, this picture takes Superman into a whole new dimension right. that, uh, that he hasn't been in before. And I think the thing about these movies is a lot of thought went into each one of them. They're all very original and stuff. But in the scene I think we're going to see now, Clark Kent has gone back to Smallville for his 15th high school reunion. <laughs> and there he meets, and they don't know who he is. They think that he's a success because he's got a job in a big city newspaper, you know. And uh, he gets there and he meets Lana Lang, played by Annette O'Toole. And uh, they become friends. And one day he takes Lana and uh, her little son Ricky bowling in the scene. That's what you're going to see right. from Superman 3. <laughs> Whatever you do, I'll buy that. Don't make me sneeze. No, no, no. I couldn't figure out where this is going. I right. didn't know where it was going. You have going. to wait for it. That's funny. <laughs> well, is there going to be a Superman four? Uh, this is this is where we get out the violins. No, I've got my diploma now, and yeah. um, 
Oh, there shouldn't have been. You're hanging up the cape and tights, are you? Yeah. That's... That clip? No, you didn't. You came back. Unfortunately, Canon Films, a cheap operation. Bad movie, bad edit. Uh, but they, I think they played the clip in the bowling alley. Where, it's kind of funny where he, as Clark Kent, he clumsily sneezes. And Annette O'Toole's clumsy kid is bowling and he's getting teased by Brad the drunk. The, the <clears throat> guy he's trying to hit on Annette O'Toole who plays Lana Lang. Anyway, you anyone who's seen the movie knows he knows the scene I'm talking about. And he like goes, Achoo! and then spit super spit comes out of his mouth and it, it hurls the bowling ball into the pins and the pins are shattered and they're like, damn, that kid can really bowl. Anyway, ha ha ha. But it was kind of a cool scene. That movie, it's a pretty bad movie, but it had some cool moments. Like where uh, Superman freezes a lake to put out a uh, chemical fire at a plant and drops like this sheet of ice, becomes rain. Anyway, which is implausible. I mean, there wouldn't be that much water to put out a fire. But anyway, it looked cool visually uh, in a pre-CGI movie. So, unless maybe there's a part of some 18th century highway robber who also wears the cape and tights, but <laughs> maybe not the same color turquoise. Topic. Somebody told me you were down at uh, Edwards Air Force Base for the landing of the space shuttle last time. Yes. Right? That must have been a thrill. Yeah, it is, but it's sort of like Thanksgiving dinner. You know, your grandmother spends all day cooking it, and everybody gets in, eats it in two seconds, and goes out and plays in the yard. Yeah. Everybody goes like, oh, it's down. Okay. Um, and they stay down there for hours waiting, right? It's exciting because, you know, it's one shot. There's no go-around. That's right, know? because they have no motor in there. And uh, I also got to fly a, uh, a mock-up of, uh, of the shuttle, and I also actually flew in a T-38. And I'm a pilot, and I have jet training and all this kind of stuff, mm. but the sort of uh, Lou Gossett Jr. type uh, captain who was taking me up in this airplane decided, <laughs> let's make Superman sick. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> sure. this guy thinks he can fly, okay, in the back seat, right? And uh, we did inverted, and we did uh, inside loops, and we did barrel rolls at 400 knots, somewhere out halfway between here and Honolulu. And I came back, and of course, I was you know, wearing this G-suit. My head was down in here like that, and my back was broken and stuff. But I had to keep it together. So oh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> you go behind the hangar. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I, remember some, I remember some years ago, I flew with the Thunderbirds in a jump seat in their air show, and they put you in the G-suit, and the pilot was not wearing the pressurized suit. Oh, yeah? Because they get used, apparently used to it and know when to, to stress. And you're ready, you know, you can feel the blood starting to drain into your legs, and the suit, of course, tightens up. And your lunch comes out your ears? And yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you want to throw up, but you don't know which way is up. <laughs> right. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, now here's a clip of Richard Pryor talking about Superman 3. No, you know what? Before that, check that. I want to play... Nope, let's alternate. I will go to Richard Pryor now. I think he's so funny in this interview promoting Superman 3, and I'll reveal why I'm talking about this movie. There we go. Let's see if I can get the audio to work for you right now. Richard Pryor. The great Richard Pryor, one of my favorite comedians. By the way, Superman 3 was shot in 1982, released nationwide in, on June 17th, 1983. Budget was $39 million. It made $80.2 million, so it was a success. Let's see if we can get this clip to work. Now. Yeah. I haven't had drugs in a long time now. And it's the first time that I'm really trying to do something about it to stay off of it. And I've been off a long time now. And it's wearing off. <laughs> no, you're not good you know how your body builds up residue? Well, I got about 30 years of residue. <laughs> so I'll be high another two years. <laughs> Funny. But don't you feel better sober? I do. I, I, I feel great. Man. I, I, I'm not, I feel scared. You know, I get a lot of, you know, those moments when I used to feel nervous, I go get a drink or something. Now I, I don't do anything about it, you know. Right. So, I guess I had to stop drinking, you know. I, I, used, I just got tired of waking up on the freeway driving 90. <laughs> And you don't remember things the next day. No, I don't remember people. I see people, I don't remember them. Richard, you remember the time you, you kissed that elephant? Go, no. I don't even remember you. You notice, though, when, you, when you're drunk, I, don't, I know people out there that drink, and see, you people drink normal. These people drink, have a couple of drinks, feel fine. Social drinking. Yeah. yeah. Me, I couldn't stop drinking to the bartender and go, we got no more liquor! <laughs> <laughs> okay! That's it! 
Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible habit. It really is, and it's tough to break. And it you can't tough. make sense. You know, you can't make sense when you're drunk. Your mind tells you to talk, and it shouldn't tell you that, because the, it, your, your lips say, I'm not going to say that like that. You know, and you start to, I'm fine. Don't worry, I don't Perfect. Yeah. In here, it's perfect. We'll take a break. We're good. Right. Imagine this. Ah, song. man. Richard Pryor. You know, there was a sadness to him, along with the comedic genius. Man, let me see something here. <laughs> we'll play a little more of this. We're talking with, uh, do you like to be called Richard or Richie? Richard or Richie's fine. Either Richard, one. Rich, Richard. I prefer Richard. Richard. Yeah. Yes. Just Richard. I bet your mother always called you Richard, huh? Yeah, my mom called me. She called me a lot. But she said, <laughs> Richard was one of the things that she would throw in now yeah. and then. Yeah. Were, you, were you folk pretty tough on you when you were growing up? Pretty tough? Yeah. I think I had, like, discipline. Discipline. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, you know, I had to be home at a certain time and do housework. You know, I, I was the only child. Chores, they used to call them on the stage. Yeah, do your chores. I'm not that old. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> chores, Just they call them. Just do a few chores around the house. <laughs> no, my grandmother used to put me to work, though, Jack. Yeah, your grandmother was... Uh... She raised me, you know. Yeah. She, she had me working. She made me do all the things necessary to do. She said, you never will know. You have to take care of yourself. You won't always have me around. You won't have a wife. She was right about that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to I think I know your grandmother. <laughs> uh, you, uh, we don't seem to be too good at it, do we? Uh, no, I'm not good at it. Are you, are you married at the present time? No. <laughs> I, I've been married, so I, I, I get embarrassed when people ask, oh, have you ever been married? You know, uh, I've been married a few times. Yeah. You know. I feel like that commercial for that, what's that, hair, hair shampoo? And, and again, and again. <laughs> I'm great friends with my wives yeah. until we get married. I really am. We have a great relationship. And darling, is there anything I can get you? I'm going, I'm going to the store, dear. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> you know, we get married and I don't see them for months. <laughs> you know? Months and I hate when the lawyer comes to you when you're getting divorced. I don't like when your lawyer comes to you and goes, I think you ought to settle. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> There's going to be some things brought up. Just settle. Okay? <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, I'm going, oh, she's going to tell about me and that goat. <laughs> <laughs> One little mistake. They never forget. Yeah. Well, maybe you should just maybe you should just have friends, lady friends. Yeah, I, I think now I have lady friends now, and I like it. And yeah. I like I like women though. I I can't say I'll never be married again, but yeah. Uh, I just I like it, so I enjoy it, and yeah. I'll keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> I asked some actress the other night about getting older, but bothered her. And she said, "Well, probably bo talking about Joan Rivers. She says, bothers women more than men. Doesn't bother you, does it? You're getting a little bit older." It doesn't, doesn't bother me. it doesn't bother me until I'm out with some young men who move faster. Yeah. <laughs> and I was at a party one time with Michael Jackson, he's a singer, right? The man danced and he spinned in the middle of the floor 20 minutes. <laughs> and then he walked forward backwards. <laughs> Move out. And I was dancing just in a And Mike said, come on, get into it. And I say, hey, Mike, sit down. You're embarrassing me. You know, don't let people know how bad I dance. Yeah. Discos are... So there's a difference. There's a difference about being older than being younger, because I, I just know that in, in the mornings, I notice it when I wake up. I know when my friends and I saw someone my age, when I was like 18, we'd see somebody 40. We'd look at each other. You don't go... <laughs> and you smell different too, don't you? <laughs> you know. Somebody said that old is always 15 years older than you are, at whatever age you are. 
death. If you're 15, somebody 30 is old. If you're 30, 45 becomes old. So I, I don't years feel old. real old, old. Yeah. Old. <laughs> you know, but I know this. I, I, I run, right? And if I run, my body says, you used to do this much faster. <laughs> and you... <sighs> <laughs> You know, you can't get it together. I also notice if I go through my address book, a lot of the names have M.D. after them. <laughs> I mean, you just, all of a sudden, you say, geez, another doctor. I mean, and <laughs> every page is... A... You ever think about calling up women you used to know, and you call them up just to Don't see... Don't do it. You know, yeah, you, sure. You call them up and, hi, who is this? It's Richard. Richard who? Richard Pryor. Uh-huh. I knew you'd call. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you usually get some husband answering the phone, though. Uh, and dating, dating, like going, see, when you've been married and you have, you get set in your ways because your wife will spoil you so that when she leaves you, you will miss her a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You know. I can't seem to find the right blend. I, I, I just, I go out with people and you go out and you have dinner and then in the middle of the dinner you're going, I have to take this woman to a movie. <laughs> I'm going, now how do I get out of dinner? You know, oh, brain surgery. <laughs> I forgot, I have to be at the hospital. <laughs> you know, having my comedy operation. <laughs> Yeah, you fall into head those old habits again. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm feeling good now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going out with women, and we talk. That's good. That's good. And that says you build friendships instead of just hopping into the sack. That's right. We, we talk. It's a very dull life. <laughs> <laughs> a little less talking and more jumping. Anyway, uh, um, Superman three is out. You, were, you, you fall in with the bad guys though, don't you? Oh, yeah, I'm tough in this one, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I slap the... Shut up! <laughs> Suck A, you heard me. <laughs> Don't be trying to fly away. Come back here. <laughs> you would do that oh, to Superman. Yeah. We got a full piece of film? We got a film clip. Does this need a setup? I don't know. I, I think it's the film clip of me skiing. That's oh, yeah, funny it. scene. You ski? I'm here with the, with the bad guys, and I'm talking Robert Vaughn and Annie Ross and Pamela Stevenson. Okay, here's an excerpt from Superman 3. Ah, oh, they didn't show the clip. Antenna TV, you know, where he falls off the skyscraper, ah! he lands on the street on the skis in front of the cars and they stop. Er oh, yeah. oh, he looks up. Oh. Mr. President, it's a nice place you have here. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what you usually do. Right? Yeah. I don't get on the Tina TV, they leave the clip in. I don't know why it's edited out of this clip. I pulled. Yeah, and I went to the movies the other night. I've seen two movies. I went to a movie the other night and I went to see my friends in a movie, Trading Places. Uh, I hear it's very good. Uh, uh, with Eddie Murphy, uh, with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. And, and you go in the movies and you start laughing, and then they be funnier than you want them to be. <laughs> right? I mean, it's funnier than you want. You be, uh, uh -huh. you start, ha, ha. Mm. They're really funny. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hysterical, man. So do I hear. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to kill him. We're going to take a break. <laughs> then you're going to meet uh, Rod the Hole from England and Emu right after this. I like the scam that his character did in Superman 3 where he, he shaves half a cent out of every paycheck at the company he's working for. He's working at a company owned by a character named Ross Webster, played by Robert Vaughn, who was Napoleon Solo and the Man from Uncle back in the day. And they used this and referenced this in the movie Office Space in 1999, the Superman 3 scam. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a second. Winding down the show, honest to goodness, I want to play one other quick clip of Christopher Reeve. This is clip, a quick clip. It's getting late. Let me see. This is a rare one. Let me see how long this is. And then I want to play a song from the soundtrack by Shaka Khan, a rare song by Shaka Khan from Superman 3 that you barely heard in the movie. E-F-G-H-I-J-K, elemental PQ. That's what a college education does for you. Close from the table. Closing. Mm -mm. All right, this is, I'm not going to play the whole thing. Eight minutes long, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short. Uh-oh. Rolling. Action. Ready? 
Well, Christopher, very, very nice to see you again. Thank and you. thank you. Right off, I have to thank you for going through this again. You know, you're one of the real stalwarts. And I'm sure I'm speaking mm -hmm. for other members of the media. We really appreciate the time you give us. Thank you. Enjoyed the heck out of Superman 3. I really did. Okay. I wonder, Chris, uh, Sounded if, phony you, as hell. if you had to pick one of the three as your favorite, which one would it be? I have to pick. Uh, I really do. Um, it's a loaded question, I think, because um, there's no right answer. You know, I, I what? I, I'm a softy. I, I like romance, and I think that um, Superman one for me contains the most satisfying um, elements of it. I, I'll never. I don't think we'll ever beat the flight around Metropolis with Superman and Lois. I think that was the tops of the whole thing. Um, and Superman three, much more of a comic book. Some people really like it better that way. You know, it's just. Slick, fast-paced, funny, a lot of laughs, moves along, and you come out and you can't believe you've just been through all that in two hours. And you come, come out blinking, trying to adjust to the daylight and, you know, remembering where you are. I, um, I miss the, the more romantic, even sentimental part of the character, but that's just my personal taste. In this one, Chris, it seemed to me that maybe there were some unique things required of you as far as the flying. Now, now uh, it true or, or, or does it just appear that way on film? Well, did you like the flying this time? I loved it. Oh, good, because I directed it. <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was, uh, had more to do with the flying this time conceptually than I did before. I used to just get on the equipment and do it. But today, uh, this film, I was more involved in the placing of the camera and of the cranes and, and the various equipment with ideas about how to make it very dynamic and at the same time so casual that it's almost a throwaway. Um, that we really, you, you wouldn't want to hook a campaign on you'll believe a man can fly. The campaign would be, of course he does, you know, <laughs> and, and, and uh, that much we can take for granted. So, um, yeah, there, there's some good flying stuff, uh, I think, and I had a good time being involved in it, but I think the measure of its success is that you don't even notice it. What about Richie Pryor in the flying? He really did have to fly, didn't he? Yeah, he had one, one quick trip. Did he like it? Well, he was called on to be terrified, which he managed to do with great mm. conviction. <laughs> and we prepared him for it. I took him up 10 feet, and then I took him up 15. And then on the day that we actually worked, we were up 60. And uh, he, he called, you know, it, it caused for him to close his eyes, put his hand over him, and scream. And he just did that fine. <laughs> <laughs> In one take, huh? No problem. <laughs> Chris, how do you look upon uh, this whole thing as Superman? Because every time I come out, I just think there's nobody else who could do that role and satisfy me as much as you do. And I'm not trying to be patronizing. But for you now, the actor, actors always want to do a wide variety of things. And you mm. do that, and you've done it all along. But is Superman for you a blessing or a curse? Well, it's a blessing. Um, and I, frankly, if I were sitting out there in the public and even sitting here, I get really tired of hearing actors say, well, of course I'm going to play Hamlet now, and I'm going to be real and serious and heavy. And all. I think uh, the public shouldn't have to know about any of that. You just uh, get on with your life, and sometimes they'll like you, and sometimes they won't. Um, but my, my intention, really, is just to carry on doing work that I like. And sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I, I don't. But I don't, um, I could not for a minute think of this as a curse, because it's, uh, it's made me financially independent. It's brought me the respect of my peers. It's gotten me a chance to work with some of the best directors in the business and, and uh, uh, to get reviews. And uh, uh, wow. I mean, and also it was such a long shot in the beginning. They all thought it was going to be a joke. And, and, and we, the filmmakers, felt we could win our way into people's hearts, and we did. How could that be a curse? Mm. I'm glad to hear you say mm. that. Do you feel, Chris, that the critics were unfair to you uh, regarding Monsignor? No, it was a horrible picture and deserved to be lambasted. Um, <laughs> honest answers, but how's man. How's that for an honest answer? <laughs> it's true. It, 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 was, it, it was a very bad movie. The thing was, it was a needlessly bad movie. And that's sadder. It's like watching somebody who should be a merit scholar um, drop out of school. Uh, and I, I say that because we had the material and it was misused. And uh, the needs and tastes of the American public were very badly played down to. And uh, I simply object to film like that because it's a waste of the right material, but also it makes serious allegations about a religious figure and fails to prove it. And boy, you know, I anything where you fail to make your point, you can call anybody anything as long as you prove it. 
And I just believe in fair play, and I just, oh, it just wasn't fair, that movie. Who was to blame? Well, I'm not, I don't want to name names, you know, it's, it's <laughs> uh, corporate decision making. Let's leave it at that. Wow. But you were such a pro, Chris, in that you went ahead and you did the promotional things that you had to do. Um, that must have been very difficult. It was. It was, particularly because I don't approve of it. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> you know, like Woody Allen says, I wouldn't want to join any club that would have someone like me for a member. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I felt, here, here I am, having to promote something that I basically don't approve of. And uh, yet, I, don't know, I'm, I am the actor. And while, since I carry the vehicle part, people um, may think that I'm responsible for the content, but I'm not. And I will always know, you can't always prove to the world what a wonderful person you are. I mean, I know what Monsignor could have been, and I'm just going to have to live with the fact that the rest of the world won't know it, you know? But it's next case. They will know, because I'm going to run this interview just like you said it. <laughs> okay. Chris, lovely to see you again. Congratulations. You have another hit with Superman 3. And, Thanks uh, a lot. Maybe I'll see you on Superman 4, okay? I don't think so, but you'll see me other places. Okay, thank you. Like death trap. So you're saying this is the Around end of Superman? Time. Yeah, you got to quit while you're ahead, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay. Is there enough room on that tape for questions? Hot mic. Hot mic. Or should we go to another tape? You have room. Oh, okay. All right. Reactions? Oh, okay. We don't... So I told you I'd cut it short. No, six minutes out of the eight, because I didn't realize the end of it was just a bunch of reaction shots and pickup shots. Now here's another quick clip of Richard Pryor talking about Superman 3. Four minutes. I miss Richard Pryor and Christopher Reeve. was inevitable, say the film's producers, because of what they claim is the combined box office gross of $600 million from the first two Superman films. Well, the newest Superman deals with contemporary computer technology as a form of villainy, but as insurance in a human form, those same producers have hired one of the screen's hot properties, Richard Pryor, to portray a character who comes to understand those computers all too well. Pryor, in his role as the bumbling Gus Gorman, is neither hero nor villain, but he is certainly the glue that holds this Superman screenplay together. Do you think so, huh? I think so. I haven't seen it, so I'm glad to hear that. As it, was that nice? That's a good thing? Yes, that's a compliment. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> was it everything you thought it would be doing that kind of film? No. <laughs> no, uh, because it was work. It wasn't like fantasy. The fantasy is, I imagine, going to see a movie like that, and, but being in one, it's real uh, hard work. Do you feel pressure as an actor when you are working in a film of that scope, and by scope I mean that budget, where every hour the, the dollar signs are clicking away? Is there a subtle pressure on an actor to perform? I didn't feel that in this movie at all, because it was Superman. I was just playing a part in it, so I felt real relaxed about stuff like that. I didn't feel any pressure, other than the fact that I didn't work a lot. I was over in England two months in a hotel, not working every day, three and four days at a time, sometimes a week. Waiting for them to call? Yes, waiting for them to call me. But there's a pressure in that, though, isn't there? Of being somewhere, <clears throat> you know, I mean, you see the palace couple of times, you know, <laughs> and you go, well, thank you. Uh, it's amazing you think about how they get made movies, you know, with all that goes into them. I mean, it's a struggle because everybody has a vision of it, and to, to get the vision to work and for the whole movie and, and your character or whatever you're playing, you know, it's a real struggle, and it takes a little uh, back and forth, you know. Uh, little just a minute can we talk <laughs> you know I'm trying to get those things ironed out and everybody is different that you work with and it all depends how they react to that and everybody reacts different to it so it's not a day at the beach making a movie I mean I thought it was one at one time when I first started you know I just would say this is great forever now I just feel it's I'm a professional you know that claim of priors was dramatically emphasized recently with the news that his company had entered into a $40 million five-year deal with Columbia Pictures, in which Pryor's firm 
headed by longtime friend Jim Brown, would turn out three films starring Pryor and be responsible for four other moderately budgeted films. At a news conference, flanked by Brown, Frank Price, and Guy McElwain of Columbia, Pryor dangled a carrot to struggling writers. What we're looking for are good scripts that we can produce under my banner and put out in the marketplace. Uh, it's no, no one's excluded. It's open door, and anyone is welcome to come in with the script. And when I say no one is excluded, I mean that. And what we're trying, what we want to do is, is do quality films with the money that we have to do it with. The first picture under the new agreement with Columbia will be the Charlie Parker story starring Pryor and based on the life of the legendary jazz saxophonist. It's scheduled to go before the cameras October 1st. Meanwhile, Richard Pryor and Superman fly onto the nation's movie screens next week. For today, Jim Brown, NBC News. I just love those vintage interviews of those long lost stars. How articulate was Christopher Reeve? Great speaker. Oh, man, had the honor of meeting him before his terrible accident. Met him in May of 1994 at the Castlegate Hotel in his only convention appearance. First, and I think only convention appearance um, with his wife, Dana Reeve, who sadly also is no longer with us. She, uh, mm, it's, it's just awful. But their, their child remains will on this earth. All right. Um, God bless Christopher Reeve and uh, Richard Pryor. Now, the story, as I mentioned, one of the plot points is that August Gorman, as I said, his character is a computer genius, and he shaves half a cent off of every dollar and every paycheck that the company he works for has printed. And uh, he makes a mistake of spending foolishly. He buys a Ferrari, for instance. And uh, mm, that scam, that computer scam, that's when the, the villain, the main villain, Ross Webster, he decides instead of turning him over to the authorities to go to jail and prosecute him, let's use that computer genius in his mind <clears throat> to get all of the world's oil and tankers and have computers just have them sit in the middle of the ocean so he can control the world's oil supply. <clears throat> but let's listen to a quick clip from Office Space talking about Superman 3 listen, as we wind down the, the show. Best programmers they got at that place. I mean, you haven't been showing up and you get to keep your job. Actually, I'm being promoted. What? I know, Michael. It's completely unfair. And I realized something today. It's not just about me and my dream of doing nothing. It's about all of us together. I don't know what happened to me at that hypnotherapist. And I don't know, maybe it was just shock and it's wearing off now. But when I saw that fat man keel over and die, Michael, we don't have a lot of time on this earth. We weren't meant to spend it this way. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day. Right. Filling out useless forms and listening to eight different bosses drone on about mission statements. <laughs> I told those fudge packers I like Michael Bolton's music. Uh, that is not right, Michael. For five years now, you've worked your ass off at Inatech, hoping for a promotion or some kind of profit sharing or something. Five years of your mid-twenties now gone. And you're going to go in tomorrow. They're going to throw you out on the street. You know why? So that Bill Lumberg's stock will go up a quarter of a point. <laughs> Michael, let's make that stock go down. And let's take enough money out of that place so that we never, ever have to sit in a cubicle ever again. Yeah. Your software works, right? Of course it works. That's not the point. Love the scene. Look, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't know how to install it. I don't know that credit union software well enough. Okay? Yeah. But Samir does. But Peter, that's not much money. Guys. That's the, the beauty people. of it. Each withdrawal, it's a fraction of a cent. That's too small to notice. <laughs> but you take a few thousand withdrawals a day, you space it out over a couple of years, that's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's like Superman 3. Superman 2. I have to leave now, okay? I have to get my resume ready. It's like, is your resume ready for what? For another job where they can just fire you for no reason? That's right. Uh, if I'm lucky. Look, I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired of being pushed around. Aren't you? Yes, Peter. But I'm not doing to do anything illegal. Illegal? Samir, this is America. <laughs> Come on, sit down. Come on. This isn't Riyadh. 
you know, we're not gonna <laughs> saw your hands off here, all right? The worst they would ever do is they would put you for a couple of months into a white collar minimum security resort. Shit, we should be so lucky. Do you know they have <laughs> like Martha Stewart there? Really? Yes. Shit. I'm a free man. I haven't had a conjugal visit in six months. So, what do you think? This thing is actually pretty fail-safe, Samir. Samir? You came here looking for a land of opportunity. And this is the knock of that opportunity. Tomorrow's your last day at Inatech. You have two options. Unemployment or early retirement. What's it gonna be? I have a question. Yes. In, in these conjugal visits, you can have sex with women? Yep. <laughs> you sure can. Okay, I'll do it. That's what I'm talking about. Superman talking 3. About Can we discuss the plan, okay? Okay, yeah, good. Right. Okay. It works like a computer virus, right? So all we have to do is load it anywhere into the credit union mainframe, and we'll do the rest. Okay, you guys get me that disc, and I will take care of it from there. But listen, before we go any further, all right, we have to swear to God, Allah, that nobody knows about this but us, all right? No family members, no girlfriends, nobody. Of course. Agreed. Don't worry, man. I won't tell anyone either. What the fuck is that? No, don't worry about him. He's cool. All right. So I love that reference to the Superman three half cent scam. Now we're winding down the show for real. I have just two more clips. One is a song by Shaka Khan from Superman three. If you're watching on camera, you can see the soundtrack album of Superman three. And there's a lot of pop songs on there. And one of them was by Shaka Khan. You barely heard in the movie, but I'll set the stage here in the scene. Ross Webster, played by Robert Vaughn, realizes that someone has been embezzling money in the half-cent scam. And he's talking to his co-workers, or, you know, his fellow executives, his sister and his lover, uh, played by Pamela Stevenson. By the way, he was married to, to this day, uh, Connolly, the stand-up comedian. Uh, Connolly, he's, he's uh, Scottish. I know his first name. I just thought of it. Damn it. Uh, Connolly, Connolly. Con now i got to look it up before I play the clip. I know the guy's name. I'm losing my mind. Um, not Jeff Connolly. Uh, da, 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 da. God dang it. Don't shut the computer down. But let's see. Connolly. Kevin Connolly? Connolly, comedian. I'm looking it up right here. Come on. God dang it. Billy Connolly, that's it, married to Pamela Stevenson, who was really hot in this movie. She was the blonde, uh, and she, she's been on, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm blithering, and I'm, I, let me get to the clip, let me get to the clip. She was really pretty in this movie, and she's smart, and she plays a character who uh, plays down her intelligence. She tries to seem like a bimbo, but she's not. She knows all about computers anyway. Her name's Lorelai Ambrosia in the movie, and she seduces the evil Superman who has been infected by the kryptonite, the synthetic kryptonite that August Gorman, Gus Gorman, played by Richard Pryor, created with an unknown element. He looked at a pack of cigarettes, he saw tar. So he couldn't figure out what the unknown element, because Krypton's from the planet Krypton, right? So it's an unknown element. Nobody knows on Earth what it was really made from, right? And no Krypton was left. So they wanted to kill Superman. The bad guy did, Ross Webster. So he says, you need to create some kryptonite. And he looks at a pack of cigarettes, Richard Pryor's character, and sees tar. So he adds tar, and then he presents the kryptonite to Superman, and it does nothing to him. I know most people have seen this terrible movie, but I think it has its moments, so I'm going to talk about it real quick. He presents the synthetic kryptonite to Superman, and it creates a schism with his personality, a good personality and a bad personality, and there's a conflict and all that, and it's just, it's like, you know, the evil twin syndrome, right? But, um... Where was I going with this? All right. Yeah, so um, Ross Webster, when he realizes that someone's been scamming money from the paychecks, he's talking to um, Pamela Stevenson's character, Lorelai Ambrosia. Oh, yeah, I was talking about because because uh, when, when he's under the influence of the evil kryptonite, um, she seduces him and he screws her. And so like Superman in the movies really – he got together with two women, Lois Lane in Superman 2, and then Lorelai Ambrosia in Superman 3, even though he was kind of under the influence, right? And there's a uh, funny extended scene 
of him getting it on with her, but we'll talk about that another time. It aired, actually, of all things, on TV, on ABC TV, starting in 1988 in the TV version. Anyway, I'm all over the place. Nobody cares, I know. But I love Office Space, and uh, I am sober. I know I sound like I'm rambling. Okay, here's the final point. All right, so Ross Webster's talking to his sister, who's becomes a robot in the movie. By the way, younger, in that scene, there's a scene where um, his sister, who's a very unattractive woman, um, gets taken over by this computer. And it's really scary. Like kids that are younger than me or kids, um, adults that are younger than me that grew up watching this movie were really scared of the scene. And I can see why it's kind of like me with the fembots and the Bionic Woman, $6 million man. Look it up. Fembots, even the Austin Powers movies and the second one brought back the concept of the fembots, female robots, right? It's kind of like the Stepford wives robots or something or Westworld. But, um, Vera is Ross Webster's sister in this movie, Vera Webster, and she gets turned into this like robot with white eyes and stuff, and it's friggin' scary. Anyway, um, but before that, Ross Webster's realizing that one of his employees has used a computer to scam him. And he's talking to his sister and uh, Lorelai, and he says he won't draw any attention to himself unless he is a complete and utter moron. And then at that moment, Ross here screeching tires he looks out his window and we see a bird's eye shot of richard Pryor driving up parking a bright red ferrari magnum pi style and as he's doing that we hear a song blasting in his in his car richard Pryor's car august gorman's car and it's a shaka khan song you barely hear it well i'm going to play the song and this is going to be the second to last clip and then i'm going to play us out with the end titles to superman 3 I don't care what, <laughs> I know I sound like a complete dork, but that's just what I planned. But here is the Shaka Khan song. I'm saving it to the end because I'm afraid that the bots will get me on it. Here's Shaka Khan. It's called, the song is titled, No See, No Cry. This is all you heard in the movie was this part of it. You don't hear the lyrics and her singing and let's listen. I'm playing this. I've lost it. I do like this song, though. I like Shaka Khan. God damn it. Excuse my language, Lord. God! 
stupid idiot ruined my song. Ruined my song. You dumb idiot. God. God dang it. Sorry, folks. I'm having a little meltdown here. God, I'm going to show this person. Hey, you just ruined, I'm live. You just ruined one of my clips. Shut up. Man, unbelievable. I ain't gonna start it over, but let me get to where I was at. I like, all right, I like Shaka Khan's, of course, I'm Every Woman, which Whitney Houston remade. And of course, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan. Fear for you, fear for you. I like that one too. I think that's where I was at. too bad they got interrupted but you get the point now the guy that did the music part of that song is Giorgio Morardo who did uh like main uh main she's a maniac maniac uh bu -bu 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 -bu. what was that flash dance yeah that's the same dude he did the music for that song I like that song you know I don't care what anybody thinks I, I do this show for you and for me and I like that song so here here's the last clip I'm gonna play the end title to Superman 3. I like this version of the theme. It's from the soundtrack. Based on the John Williams music. But this is by Ken Thorne, who did the music for Superman 2 and 3. See you next week in the Nostalgic Pod Blast, I hope. Good night.
second. I know I said I was signing off. If you're uh, watching on camera, you'll see I put the album for, for Your Eyes Only soundtrack on screen. And it's a great shot from the movie poster of a woman holding a crossbow facing Bond, who is armed with his standard issue weapon, a gun. And when I was a kid, there was a rumor that that was a guy's legs. And I just don't see it. And I don't believe it. But nothing wrong with that. Listen, I'm not being a phobe of any kind. I'm just saying, if you're watching, I know if you're listening at FistleRadio.com, just visualize the movie poster to the James Bond movie, If Your Eyes Only, released in 81. That picture of hot legs with Bond in between them, not in between them literally, but, you know, you see his figure, his silhouette in the tuxedo holding his gun. Anyway, I digress. Also, I wanted to break up that end title music in case the bots get me and it gets muted. If you ever are listening to the Nostalgic Pod Blast um, on Facebook primarily after it's live and all of a sudden the sound goes out, it's not a technical problem. It's not at your end. It's not at my end. It means that a bot or robot has muted the sound, particularly of a song. And so I like to play Dodgebot. I try to get around that, um, you know, without getting into trouble <laughs> or doing anything wrong but let's continue with superman 3 entitled by ken thorne i like this version um i like all kinds of music i like normal music okay i like rock i like rap i like all kinds of music but also i like some instrumental music like this and this is my favorite version well i guess the john williams would have to be i might like that a little bit more than this but i like this version a lot the superman 3 entitled version um, but now I really am going to say good night and I appreciate each and every one of you in the audience and, I uh, got a great topic for next time. I won't give it away what it is and got some guests coming up. No fooling and, uh, have a great, great week. <laughs>